today. Let's talk about today. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I'm a little tired. It's been a long day. Uh, <laughs> cool. sh- yeah, a little midnight flight, but uh, what a course, man. What a course. Beautiful. You guys played really well. I think you birdied like three or first four, something crazy. It's a good start. It's a good yeah. start. That was a good start. I was either in my pocket or putting for birdie, so <laughs> not a great day for me. You got to take in the yeah, sights. I'm a gamer, hard. though. You know, I want to see the whole course. I haven't been here before. You're right. So. Make sure you not get bit by snakes. And yeah, I was trying everything. to find them. Yeah, I was actually putting out some energy when I was walking. Like, I mean you no harm, Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Snake. If you're out there, I got no problem with you. Okay, this is your land. Just give me a little, you know. Didn't hear any rattles. rattle, yeah. and I'll get out of your way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and thankfully didn't see any. <laughs> I saw some pictures when I walked in. The, I think it was Deborah at the front, and. Um, and JJ both showed me like he, pictures of humongous snakes from last week. Well, saying. there's that taxidermy one, right? Right. right. Well, there's that one too. too. Yeah. The fangs. Yeah. yeah. It's some kind of intimidating. Yeah, it was fun to play too with a couple of your, you know, long longest friends. It sounds like, and I, I didn't realize you've been playing golf your whole life. They said you guys been playing together since high school nearly. Yeah, we had a sweet deal growing up at the uh, local uh, Muni Bidwell Park Golf Course. It was uh, four dollars for a junior rate, so if you're under eighteen. Nice. Uh, you could play all day for four bucks. So in the mm. summers, we'd go out at like six in the morning and get 36 in by like noon and then go jump in the swimming holes and mess around the rest of the day. But we loved playing golf. So there was like four of us that played a bunch. Jordan was usually my partner. Um, so we had some great victories and some uh, arguments <laughs> after some L's over the years. But I met him when I was 14. So... I've uh, been one of my oldest oldest friends, and then Matt. Uh, Matt was a year younger, but I've known Matt since you know around the same time, so it was pretty cool. What yeah. is? I, I just met Matt today. What does he like to do? Matt, yeah, he likes to golf. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we all like to golf. Yeah, but well. uh, but yeah, Matt's been helping with uh, with raw. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so he does uh, a lot on the uh, on the uh, engagement, the sales, the marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, He's been in sales, I think, for most of his career so far. But uh, he's just an awesome guy. He's a, he's a connector. You know, he's a network guy. Nice. So he's good at uh, kind of putting people together. But, <laughs> um, nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah those are two, two awesome guys. I've never been in ceremony with Matt. But Jordan and I have been close friends since we were 14, and we've sat in ceremony before. So when you sit in ceremony with somebody, yeah. you're bonded for life. Absolutely. Like you and I. <laughs> I was talking about that the other day, just reminiscing on, on that ceremony. It was the first one that I did that didn't have the element of fire and music that has always been so transformative for me in ceremony because music just like, I don't know, with ayahuasca, I start seeing sound and hearing color, which usually doesn't happen in daily life. No. Um, but But those ceremonies were really special, just them with... Uh, the ikaros and no fire and no music and no light and them just singing to you and taking notes on the things that you needed to heal or your intentions for that ceremony is pretty special yeah i i've done three lineages now the uh, shipipo the quechua and now the yawanawe tribe from brazil and uh, all are beautiful. I have so much love, respect, mad reverence for the medicine and for all the difficult lessons that she's taught me over the years. But I love this last ceremony with the Yawanawe because there's they play guitar, they play the bongos, there's some drums, there's singing, there's dancing. On top of the Ikaros, there was a beautiful kind of um, free-flowing ceremony space where the understanding was you start and finish together but in the middle um if you want to go outside laying the grass you can if you want to look at the stars you can if you want to go sit by the fire you can um and i just fell in love with the (laughs) yawanawe with the medicine they serve with the facilitation it was a beautiful maestro Uh, his wife his wife's sister and another amazing woman basically is the main facilitator so three women and and one one man and it just felt so divinely feminine which is the you know the essence the um uh the signature of i is the mm-hmm. grandmother mm-hmm. but this was a whole nother level of just feeling like that 
beautiful divine feminine energy just kind of holding us in some moments of difficulty <laughs> <laughs> yeah to, to say the least a lot of people I, I i try to look into the lens of of podcasts or the, especially the ones that we do from from a lens of people not having any idea of of this um discussion and, and this topic of plant medicine specifically ayahuasca more specifically and um it's it's really hard to explain that it's not a psychedelic drug like you take at a at a a concert like mushrooms and you go party with friends it's not something that you're honestly like really looking forward to because it's dip, it's difficult it's tough work it's it's work on yourself yeah. And somehow it's a an all-knowing entity that each person is served the same glass, but it knows you, what it needs to do for you. Like, what what are some ways that I'm sure coming back from ceremonies, people ask you like, "Oh, how is it?" or "What is it?" Like, if you were to tell someone what ayahuasca was and what it does for you to someone who didn't know what it was, what would you say? What do you say? I mean, I've gotten some shit over the years for really correcting people when they say drug and mm -hmm. reminding them plant. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's obviously, you know, two plants that come together to allow mm -hmm. uh, your body to um, break down and, and uh, the, the DMT. Mm -hmm. um, drugs are substances that are associated with addiction to me and plants or fungi are not. Um, yeah. I have a deep reverence, again, no judgment, but my preference in doing medicine uh, is in a ceremony setting, just because I want to do it to to grow, to mm -hmm. expand, to learn, to listen, to surrender. And uh, every journey is different. We always, uh, you know, I've heard it said, I've said it, you know, the, the medicine gives you exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. And when you say medicine, we're not talking about, I'm talking about, or, I'm talking about ayahuasca, yeah, plant medicine, yeah. plant medicine <laughs> okay. gives you exactly what you need. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, there's a consciousness to it that, like you said, 100%. sometimes, uh, the last night of this, uh, most recent ceremony, I, I drank the least amount of Aya, uh, of the other t you know, three ceremonies, uh, you know, the other two ceremonies or the third ceremony. I drank the least and had the most visions, the most wow. um, incredible experience. And I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, stereotypes and myths that need to be busted around it. Uh, I think it's always important to not, um, I'm not recommending people do it. You know, I think that's a line you have to draw. Like yeah. when the medicine calls you, then, then mm -hmm. listen and, and lean in. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's tough work. You know, you're not, you know, when, when I've, agreed to do this last retreat i, was, I wasn't thinking oh man i can't wait to fucking yeah. trip in the jungle <laughs> no. i was thinking okay it's gonna be some tough work yeah i can't wait to see what comes out and the growth but mm -hmm. you know going in this is going to be some deep soul work and deep self-love and you're going to go into the ego and the shadow and and face your fears and your mm -hmm. insecurities and mm -hmm. and then have a choice to surrender and allow the medicine to do its work and to trust or to resist and yeah. shoot i've been both places before <laughs> yeah. i've definitely tried to resist and it just makes it worse it so does it i've does. learned and it was a beautifully uh, facilitated uh three ceremonies and the yamana way are just uh happy incredible happy people very yeah. happy and it was just mm. beautiful beautiful divinely feminine uh signature experience and i uh, came back just just desperately desiring for that ceremony feeling ceremonial feeling in the rest of my life mm. and the question that kind of comes to mind after a week of integration in uh in Kauai is how can you make that feeling last because i think that's what we're all trying to do most of the time it's hard for us well, anybody when they come back from ceremony like take time for yourself to integrate meaning to just like sit mm -hmm. with the lessons allow them to kind of continue to come through mm -hmm. integration takes more than just a week after ceremony but how do we create space and time for ourselves, which is so hard, I think, for all of us to do because we're busy people and mm -hmm. we have lives and spouses and loved ones and kids for some of us. And um, I just really decided to take time. And in the in the reflection, it's how can I make that feeling last? Because when you're in the retreat center, for me personally, when I get into that environment, 
just the nervous system just relaxes mm -hmm. and you're just like so thankful to be um back in for me like a really special place in costa rica obviously it's, it's special for you as well <laughs> but it's really been the, some of the biggest healing in my life has happened down there and i'm thankful to have uh, gone back to to the womb uh of, of costa rica in the ceremony <laughs> space and and uh come out uh a little bit changed it's so special man the the accumulation of people that have ended up down there, whether it's for ceremonies, whether it's the shamans that come in to facilitate or the expats or the locals, like it's just, um, there's some vortex down there. That's I think the new natural healing hub of the world. Um, at least that, that was my journey for the last 10 years to find that of like, where can I go that has all the best modalities of healing naturally? and Nosara specifically is what I found. And um, yeah, trying to build that space of what I needed and, and finding through the, the ceremonies and the, the surrendering. And <laughs> it's funny we laugh like, because you know you just, how hard it is <laughs> yeah. to surrender, but then when you fully do, it's like, if people listening to this are, are kind of clueless in this, it doesn't matter what you understand or not it's like everyone knows what surrendering feels like in one way or another um but the ultimate trust of whether you're doing plant medicine or not of trusting your life or trusting the decision that you're making or trusting a goal that you're setting is there's nothing more powerful i don't think um and i've learned that in in ayahuasca and like the first two nights i ever did it i was enamored by what was happening and what I was seeing, but, um, I was, I was comfortable. Uh, I had a blanket over me. I was on a bed. I had a pillow. I was curled up. I was seeing sounds. It was great. But the third night I, I ever did it, I f fully surrendered. I'm like, all right, no blankets, palms up, like, let's go. And, uh, just the, the prompt of showing me what I've become is really, change has really changed my life and i'm sure for you it has as well i mean you can't you can't come back and be the same it's just not possible <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you see the other side when you see the depth when you learn a new edge uh, which is one of the reasons i love doing medicine is because it takes you to your mm -hmm. perceived edge mm -hmm. uh edge of uh discomfort edge of uh dealing with adversity Mm -hmm. edge of sitting in the fire of uh, insecurities and fears coming up and then surrendering, melting into the moment and then uh, transcending that moment. Uh, it's really special. You just, you learn a lot about yourself and I'm thankful <laughs> for the medicine <laughs> because, you know, who I was kind of before doing ayahuasca and now having set uh, in, uh, you know, a number of ceremonies, um, uh, it's changed my life. Yeah. I, I go back to, you know, I love what you said earlier about trying not to push it on people too, or like mm -hmm. make an outward suggestion because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you are the first person to introduce plant medicine, you know, generally in any capacity to me. And when I had my first ever ceremony, it was down in Costa Rica. It was a Huachuma San Pedro ceremony with Iran. Mm hmm and I'll never forget, I think, you know, the night was broken into these five pillars of prayer. And the last prayer was a prayer to future generations, right? And part of what he said in it was, you don't need to now walk the world and be, you know, we're a walking spokesman for Huachuba, right? And the reason for that is because this prayer and this pillar has existed for generations upon generations before us sitting here tonight that has prayed upon landing on someone to be in this place again. And it was this incredible moment where you realize like these hundreds of years that had gone into a moment that, you know, in this case I shared there. And, uh, I guess where, where I'd love to, you know, ask both of you guys, frankly, was where the curiosity first came inside of you to open your mind to plant medicine. You want to take that to start or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess, um, where was my first time for plant medicine? Um, where, where it came into my life. I, I was, 
once I got the diagnosis for a muscular dystrophy, I was in complete disbelief. Um, and then I started the thing that I latched onto first was, uh, cleansing my body. So I would, I was starting to really take in certain herbs and special herbs, uh, through tinctures and then also do fruit cleanses and down to water cleanses. And in that time, like you can't really, I mean, you can, I guess if you're very advanced, but you can't, I couldn't do much. Like it was just relaxing and, and letting my body heal. And, um, so I was reading a lot. I was doing a lot of research on the best healers around the world and yeah. how people healed naturally from incurable diseases, yeah. um, diseases. And, um, I found, um, I guess, I guess I, I started talking with one of my buddies, Taylor Massey, actually, <laughs> um, about ayahuasca. And he was like, oh, there's this place down in Costa Rica called Rhythmia. Um, like it's, it's getting big. It's like a, a good entry way in from the Western world, uh, because it's very comfortable and, and they do kind of like a five star upscale retreat type job. And, um, there he was like, you should go check it out. And so, um, Chelsea and I got married and, um, on the night of our wedding, we did mushrooms and Ooh. it was, <laughs> it was like, the that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was the second time I ever did it. The first time was at my bachelor party, which we went hiking and camping out in the, um, in the desert outside of Las Vegas. And it was entourage style. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Area 51. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you might've seen, <laughs> seen some things out there. Yeah. Uh, and it was the most incredible experience of my life because <laughs> I guess this is going to sound weird and we'll be out in the public now, but I had a conversation with a rock, a boulder for a couple hours. And it basically taught me all of its knowledge that it's seen throughout the years that it's been there. However, many years that is and it was like you need to use light to heal yourself and because we're light beings and we're energetic electrical beings and to utilize different meditations of seeing light come through your crown and into your body and then just healing whatever it needs to and so i got really curious about that and um chelsea and i decided uh during that mushroom ceremony that we wanted to go to Rhythmia and do ayahuasca next because like this plant medicine thing, there was something to it. Like the, yeah. these self discoveries and these self teachings, uh, were really insane. And so we, we went to Rhythmia and it was amazing. And then got connected with people in Nosara for a boga. And yeah, well, as, as Aaron said, like once you do it, you never, yeah. you can't see the world the same. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think my uh, interest uh, was kind of spiked growing up in the church with uh, one specific verse from the Bible uh, as I paraphrase but it was talking about uh, that the battle is not between uh, uh, flesh and blood but uh Basically, there's an unseen world that we're battling against. And I always thought, what do you mean? What's the unseen world? Um, how do I see that? And enamored by some of the interesting things that happened in the Bible, that was my reference growing up. Um, the burning bush, uh, obviously, um, uh, ascension uh, you know, into heaven by Jesus, uh, his resurrection, all these different miracles. I've just always loved sci-fi movies. I believe in magic. I believe in miracles. I believe in manifestation. Didn't quite have the words to put that into perspective or to make it make any sense to me or anybody else for a long time. But I was interested in what the other side was. And I had a very magical psilocybin experience um, on, the, on a beach in Malibu where I just kind of merged with the uh, with nature um, and had a conversation mm. not with a rock <laughs> but uh, with the ocean wow and it was uh, the most beautiful tears of joy uh, that I'd ever experienced of just pure euphoric 
connection to the universe, to nature, to all things. Oneness. Uh, oneness, yeah. And then Jordan, who's who's here with us, he went down to uh, Temple of the Way of Light in uh, Colombia and did ayahuasca. Did, I think, five or six ceremonies and came back and we were playing golf. And he told me all about it. And I said, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And When was that? That was in 2019 he did it. And I did it in 2020 in March. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah. There's a couple of good football seasons that followed that. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple, <laughs> couple MVPs. So. What, all right. So what did you learn? What did you take from it that would you say it helped your football career? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I had a really, uh, fear, a strong fear of death for most of my childhood. Uh, anybody around my age, uh, I was born in 1983, knows what, how strange it was to be a teenager when Y2K was coming. <laughs> and how I grew up, Y2K was probably a bigger deal. Uh, it just seemed to be there was a lot of people in our sphere who thought the world was going to end in 2000. And so I had a major fear of the world ending, some sort of death coming and not being able to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish in this life. Because I felt like that the, my destiny was to, you know, be an NFL player and and, uh, and use that as a platform to uh, to do a bunch of, bunch of awesome stuff. And I just said, I can't do that if the, I'm 16 years old and the world ends in Y2K. <laughs> So I had this irrational fear of death that kind of stuck with me for a long time. And in this first ceremony, uh, grandmother just took it away, just took it away by breaking the veil between this world and the unseen world for me, which was allowing me to get an impartation, uh, a blessing uh, in the form of a prayer of laying of hands on by uh, what my intuition, my gnosis told me was my ancestors who surrounded me in the Maloka, tiny little Maloka, like it's the size of this room probably, but it was filled up by just a hundred people that I recognized by sight. I couldn't tell you this was my great uncle, or this was so-and-so, but there was a knowing as I looked at their faces that we have some sort of blood connection. You know, we are, um, you are my uh, ancestors. And they did this beautiful laying of hands on where I felt a hundred different hands on my body, just imparting this energetic prayer for safety, for protection, for guidance, for self-love, um, for trust, for surrender, for all these different things. And, and I came out of there going, okay, this life has a purpose. Uh, my life matters. And this is not the end. This is just uh, another step in the, in the journey. Uh, life as we know it, death as we know it and talk about it is just another step in the, in the journey. So that was kind of my first, um, entrance uh into plant medicine and it grew from there and there was beautiful uh really rough uh ceremonies in uh, the preceding years but uh but yeah that was kind of the first lesson i learned i remember when we were at soltara soltara doing ayahuasca um we had a conversation about fears and we randomly were talking about skydiving i think mm -hmm. and you're saying that's a fear of mine and we i said i did it and I asked you if you had, you said no, but you said you were going to because you want to face all your fears in life. And like, would, did that stem from a plant ceremony or just not necessarily you to just, I think uh, just a mindset. I think mm -hmm. of, of, um, it's the same mindset when you go into a plant medicine ceremony, there is insecurity and fear around what's going to happen, what you're going to see, what you're going to experience, what your experience is going to be like. Um, and I've had two kind of irrational uh, fears. I mean, they seem irrational, but I know a lot of people have the same, similar ones, but uh, uh, sharks and heights are two of my biggest fears. So sharks, I did Shark Week a few years back. Oh, yeah. I went on a boat from San Diego. We went out to this shelf in 30 miles off the coast where the 300 feet of water dips down to 3,000 feet of water and the, uh, the cold water that comes up creates this uh, interesting uh, spot of... Uh, uh, you know, conjunction of uh, the cold water and the warmer water from shallower depths. And it's like apex predators. So we go out there, we're looking for either great whites, makos, or blue sharks. And I had this interaction with this like 11 or 12 foot blue shark. And I felt uh, 
much better about <laughs> being in the water with sharks after that. Heights is a whole different story. I I have a dear friend, Jimmy Graham, who uh, is one of the most interesting guys in the world. And he's uh, uh, multi-talented, flying planes, flying helicopters, building a catamaran. He's going to sell around the world. Um, but he's also jumped out of a plane like, I don't know, maybe 100 times. And so I do have this desire to to, to do that at, at one point. He likes to jump with uh, some of the SEALs and, and uh, Rangers and, and different, you know, Special Forces guys, which I think would be fun. But that's I'd awesome. like to do it by myself. Yeah. I think that's the, the part of it, uh, jumping out of a plane without being strapped on to somebody. Yeah. Uh, facing that fear head on i haven't had the opportunity nor the desire to do that anytime soon but <laughs> that's definitely on the on the kind of far out uh bucket list nice i love uh, it yeah didn't uh didn't travis pastrana do it without a, a parachute like he went out he jumped out of the plane with his buddies with no parrot he had yeah. no parachute on and they attached it to him in the descent is insane. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd lose the. <laughs> I don't want to do that. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or he chased after the parachute in the air or something. Yeah, it was it was wild. Yeah, that's that's, 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 too, yeah, that's a little much. Yeah, that's just <laughs> get your hands sweating right now. Yeah, that's that's a little much there. <laughs> I feel like looking into fears though, and facing a lot of those unknowns, those walls that you talked about earlier that we put up in our minds. Like you and I were recently reading that Untethered Soul. Mm-hmm. You know, and it talks about the the walls of fear we create in our head, and how it's so much of it's an illusion that we create. And I even I relate it to my my grandparents who were staying with me a couple of weeks back, and you know they are just in love with the news every day, and they live in so much fear. You know, they can't mm-hmm. they can't even go outside because they're just they're they're afraid. And it's you you watch the news, and it's like, well, what's the most powerful human emotion that draws us in? To, to lean in and want to learn more it's fear mm-hmm. right so well they're a for-profit and what are they going to sell the most fear yeah. that's my opinion at least but it really was like watching it, it and seeing them it, it kind of you know worried me but i guess where i the question i'd ask you in that though is wh- where do you find the strength to continue to push into your fears and what's it unlock for you when you do mm-hmm. well i think um there's a saying that perfect love casts out fear Mm. and so the search for that perfect love uh, which for me is just that unconditional self love that is the eliminator of fear and insecurity when you can face off against your shadow the worst parts of yourself the secrets the negative critics sitting on your shoulder telling you um, what you can and can't do Mm -hmm. who you are uh, which are lies, you know, because the critic is is uh, incredibly good at shit talking you, <laughs> the anti you. But um, yeah, finding a way to to give yourself the unconditional love. I like to say it's like a best friend, right? For most of our best friends, if they're truly a best friend, they have so many chances to fuck up. Mm. Like they literally <laughs> do. They have so many chances to mess up because you're like. Well, that's my homie, you know, mm-hmm. like, I know he's got a good heart. Right. I know he loves me. I know he'd have my back in a heartbeat. But how often do we give ourselves the same type of latitude? We just don't do it. It's like we're so quick to judge ourselves. And I've been a perfectionist most of my life. And it's helped me in a lot of ways in my sport, for sure. Yeah. The striving for greatness. However, what I've learned in the last few years is, is that at the core of a perfectionist, most of us don't actually even understand this but we are making um a conscious statement un- unconscious subconscious statement about ourselves that we are broken because if we're constantly trying to face perfection and we haven't achieved that in our mind something is wrong with us so we're broken so we go through life with a usually unrealized um uh, you know stigma um, attached to us it's dogmatic that we are something is missing mm-hmm. and to live life like that is a really desolate place and that's where depression can come on and and self-loathing and negative self-talk so that's one thing I've really tried to to eliminate is how do I how can I be as gentle as possible as if I'm talking to myself as as if it's my best friend mm-hmm. and they have a million chances to mess up uh, because I think with our best friends, we say, you know what, they're just trying to do their best. You know, they're, they're, they got a good heart. That's why they're our best friend. And if they mess up, 
probably wasn't intentional. They're probably just doing their best and they'll probably do it better the next time. So how do I give that unconditional love back to myself, which in turn eliminates the fears, eliminates the insecurities and allows me to just surrender to, uh, you know, to the moment and be present. And the more we're present, the more we listen to the whispers of the universe and we see her speaking and guiding us in so many ways. And I joked with you just a second ago at dinner, um, I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> so much mm-hmm. had to happen for things to be, even for me to be right here. Right, yeah. Uh, one thing changed from the first time I reached out to you to now, and and this wouldn't be the conversation. You sure. know, there might be some different semblance of this at a different time, but not here, not right now, not in this moment. And I think there's a lot of beauty <laughs> in, in just that. So, we talked also about... A situation in 2021 where I, um, we played the, the Niners in COVID year, and we had a late comeback. I hit Devontae on a couple uh, deep ones after they had scored and left us 37 seconds. Mason drills a 51 yard field goal to win the game. And after the game, I just watched uh, Moneyball that, that day, bored in the hotel room, one of, you know, one of my uh, favorite movies with Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. And, and there's an incredible line of, of, about perspectivity in the movie that says, how can you not be romantic about baseball? And I just sat with that line the entire day um, and just contemplated what was he actually saying? What was Jonah saying in that moment? What was Brad saying in that moment? And what it comes down to is that your perspective informs your reality and your reality becomes your truth. Mm -hmm. And so what we focus on becomes our, our reality and that becomes the tenets of what we believe to be true about ourselves, about the world we live in, about our loved ones. So if we focus on the right things, we can change our entire life and manifest the wildest dreams that we possibly can have. Mm. And for so long, I fought against just the idea that I'm, uh, that football was my identity. But in fact, it's been the greatest love story for me since I was a kid growing up, listening to games on the radio, listening to John Madden and Pat Summerall on Sunday mornings, watching the Super Bowl from my living room, you know, carpet, dreaming of being Joe Montana. And yeah, I'm a football player and I love it. And how can you not be romantic about football when so much of what I've been given and the opportunities and the platform has come from throwing a ball. (laughs) That's so cool. That's epic. It's amazing. That I mean that, you know, that that moment, I'll never forget watching that game. Sunday night football after the game, just that's my favorite Aaron Rodgers moment personally, because you could feel that love, you know. And then that's something that every child can relate to something that you feel early in your life where you just you love something, right? And what a, I love the way you just described that 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 was your first love and what a love story. Like, yeah, gosh, that's cool. Isn't it funny? Like huh. we just had Rory on, and yeah. he said it was my. It was the hardest thing for me to overcome is golf is my identity yeah. for so long. And ironically, around 2020 is when he figured it out. Yeah, he it's said. true. And he's like, I used to, as any golfer, would look at the scoreboard and relate how I would feel to the number. And it's funny, like with athletes and what you said about perfectionism. And I wonder like where it comes from. I know for me, my my father was hard on me and it was more of you suck than congratulations or good job. And, um, I think a lot of times it stems from, you know, you hear people talk about the first seven years of your life and you don't even realize what the programming is happening. Um, but would you say that your perfectionism comes from a trauma or a, a way of life or something you wanted to be or a way you like obviously it made you get to where you are like camilo alluded to the same thing he's Mm -hmm. like look i'm an absolute perfectionist and detail oriented and everything and sometimes it's my downfall but sometimes most of the time it's what got me here yeah i mean I, i i really do believe that um there's pros and cons to that to chasing perfection for me, it was never being satisfied. Mm-hmm. Now there's a whole, you know, uh, associations with that, that you live your life just like constantly looking for the next best thing. Now, I don't think that's a great way to live. But when it comes to my sport, I was like, what else can I do? No one knows who I am. I'm in high school. No, I'm not on any list. No one's recruiting me. But I know I can do this. I know I'm going to do this. 
So just that striving for perfection was amazing. I think, you know, there's there's a lot that goes on in childhood. There's conditioning. Uh, there's survival. You know, there's uh, adaptation. Uh, you're learning life lessons. You're learning how to survive in a family. And I don't say survive like life or death, but just like maneuver your way to feel safe. I think we're always trying to feel safe. That really came up this last uh-huh. ceremony, just the idea of safety. But mm-hmm. for me, I mean, on some level, it was just like, I want to make my dad proud. So how do I make him proud? Be the best damn player in every sport. Because he came to almost every one of my games growing up. Doesn't matter if I was playing baseball, or soccer, or basketball, or eventually football in eighth grade. Um, yeah, I wanted to be great. Because I, for whatever reason, attached uh, love to greatness. Mm-hmm. So as a kid, you want to feel that love. So right, wrong, or indifferent, if I didn't play good, there was something inside me that said I wasn't worthy to be loved mm. because I was 0 for 4 or 3 strikeouts, yeah, yeah. which didn't happen a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, that's probably not a great example. I don't know if that ever happened. Definitely not maybe in Little League. But, um, but you know, I think we, we, we do that to ourselves. You know, the, the, the anti-us can be very persuasive because – he or she knows exactly where to hit us, you know, exactly what to say to us to like get us to just question, am I worthy to be loved? Am I a good person? Am I a good son? Am I a good uh, partner? Am I a good husband? Am I a good father? Whatever it might be, the the anti-us is incredible at attacking us where we're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And for me growing up, I just, you know, I felt felt that greatness and love, that was a connection. If I was great, I deserved to be loved. If I wasn't, hmm. Then there was a question. Mm-hmm. And again, it's not projecting. I'm not projecting that onto how I was raised. It was just my own interpretation of the situation that I was in. Right. Yeah. And at the same time, it drove me. You know, I had a perfectionist head coach at Cal and Jeff Tedford, and Jeff was amazing. You know, everything he wanted to be perfect. And he pushed me to, to raise the level of my game, to mm-hmm. strive for that perfection. Tom Clements, my quarterback coach for much of my career, especially my young career in Green Bay, would down, would grade me as hard as anybody's ever graded me. And when I started my first time in 2008 and on through my MVP seasons, Tom was with us till 2015. I won two MVPs during that time. Mm-hmm. I had some great games, I thought, and I'd come back and I'd get like an 80% grade because he pushed me to – a different level of greatness, a mm. different level of perfection. And that drove me. Mm. And in, in some ways, I wanted to make him proud. Mm-hmm. I wanted to see that fucking 99 <laughs> grade, which rarely happened. But I love that about Tom is that he held me to a standard that I maybe didn't even know that uh, right. I could hold myself to. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of a lot of beauty in that, a lot of pros in that. I've mentioned the cons. Um, but it, it returns to that self-love. And I, I think, um, like Rory said, like, we are what we do, and, and that's okay. As long as um, we can love ourselves through that. Mm-hmm. I think for so long I tried to fight against the idea that I was just a football player, you know? I'm like, no, I'm kind of smart, and I have other interests. I like reading, I like traveling, I like playing golf, I like doing other things. You know, I'm knowledgeable about a bunch of random facts. I was on Jeopardy, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, I'm more than just a football player. I hosted Jeopardy, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is I am a football player, and I'm so fucking proud to say that and thankful for the sport and what it's given me Mm. and it's okay for that to be my identity as long as it's not uh my life story Mm -hmm. Uh, because at some point the ride ends and there's so much more life and that's what plant medicine has opened up for me is the the excitement about the next chapter Mm. Mm. man so much I want to touch on. Yeah, so a lot of it. Just Sorry, I rambled. So no, I, I <laughs> love it. It's no, great. The um, man, there's so many things that are hard to do in life, but when you do them, it's like the ultimate bliss, and it's the ultimate opening of new realities. Mm. And yeah. what you said about loving yourself is something fairly new to me and and i think the reason why you did the watching with the san pedro ceremony is because i explained my experience with it and it's deemed as a heart opening 
um, medicine, the cactus and the way that they serve it. Um, and it was the first time that I ever said, I love you, Morgan Mm. ever. And I cried for hours and it was so powerful. And to be able to, to do that in, in your career and, and be self-aware is, is really a lesson that I, I hope a lot of people can strive for because I didn't even know about it for the longest time. I didn't know that you could feel it. And we just did a 30 day challenge of, of every morning when we wake up, look in the mirror and say, I love you, Jack. I love you Morgan, like to yourself and not just like one time and go on and brush your teeth. It's like, look in your eyes and truly believe it. And was, was there a time that you remember that was like a, a mark in, in your life in the last few years or whenever that you started truly embracing who you were and, and loving the full Aaron? I mean, I think a lot of it started um, post uh, Super Bowl. So when the Super Bowl in 2011, February, and my life changed for sure. I was... Uh, you know, good football player up until that point. And then I became Super Bowl champion. I won MVP in 11. State Farm commercials came out. And now <laughs> I was like like a famous football player. And life was a lot different. Um, and that was very tough to navigate and to uh, stay grounded, to stay humble. Um, but it was the beginning of a lot of uh, the contemplation around unconditional self-love and it took a long time and a lot of years and I'm still working on it uh it's a journey that uh has some ups and downs but um there's there's always a moment that kind of like is a perspective moment and for me it was sitting on the bus post Super Bowl with a trophy in my hand and a cigar in my mouth uh on top of the proverbial world you know we just Mm. won the Super Bowl I had a great game uh, in my biggest moment and so much pride in what we accomplished. I I was literally living out my dream and it was the number one on my bucket list, win the Super Bowl. Number two might have been win Super Bowl MVP, you know, (laughs) but win the Super Bowl was number one and we did it. And I just said, now what? And then now what was a really fascinating question to contemplate because there was like immediately a little bit of like insecurity mm-hmm. and like uh doubt about like who am i you know like now i've accomplished this thing that i always wanted to accomplish and i'm not as happy as i thought i was going to be so what is missing i couldn't put the words to it nor was i you know, aware enough to know that it was that self-love. It was the redefinition of success uh, off of a win-loss matrix, strictly binary system um, to, again, recalibrate uh, that perspective so that my reality is informing my truth of uh, that, uh, that there are values in life and that success is not binary. It's not win-loss matrix. Um, it's what I mentioned earlier, and I've said a few times, it's often just doing your best and doing uh, the best you can with the knowledge you have in the moment um, on your journey. So that has been that was kind of the beginning of the exploration in self-love. Uh, hasn't culminated, thankfully. It's never-ending. Mm-hmm but there's been some really beautiful moments sitting with myself and just like being my, my own best friend, you know, and not in the mirror, but just like telling myself I am enough, you know, I am proud of myself. I am worthy of, of love and I can give and receive love. And it doesn't have anything to do with anything I do on the football field or in the plant medicine space or anything else that people see publicly or that I know uh, I'm all about privately that take all that away. I'm still worthy of self-love. And so yeah, that was, that was quite, quite the journey. (laughs) 
And so when you first started saying those phrases, did they fully resonate or was it hard to connect to them? Because I know that in our experiment, like you would share, Mm -hmm. oh, when I look in the mirror, like I don't, maybe you can explain it. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, as, as you were talking, what I was thinking most about is like the voices that go on in your head, you know, cause that's something we can all relate to in this human experience is this, well, friend or enemy that you're hearing in your ear. And, uh, personally, like, I feel like I've struggled more in my life with the enemy side that's telling you why you can't do something and why you shouldn't and the fear of it. And it's definitely a space that I'm like diving into and facing more. Uh, but that's something every human being can relate to is those voices that are constantly never ending and going on in your head and in, in your head, like what are some of the voices of doubt that have crept up for you and how have you continued to face them? There's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot. I mean, it's, it's, uh, Again, the anti us that lives in our head is yeah. the best shit talker of all time because I love that knows term. all the I've secrets. Never heard that. The anti us, yeah, yeah. The anti Aaron is <laughs> extremely smart, extremely conniving, extremely triggering, um, and and so it's it's a good it's a good battle. Um, we're always we're always trying to like you know, figure out a way to have some sort of, um, homeostasis with, you know, our, our self-love and it goes up and down from time to time. But, um, for me, I think what really helped was, uh, lean into habits and doing some reading about habits. I learned that most take about 21 days to form to kick a habit or to start a habit. So what I started doing in like 2016, I think it was, I got this app and I started speaking these mantras into my phone and then I would play them back every morning on the drive in to work and hearing my own voice saying these Mm. declarative I am statements was really powerful for me. Mm -hmm. And it was everything, reasons why I'm worthy to be loved, things that I believe about myself to be true. And it's, pretty fascinating what can happen in just a short amount of time when that becomes your daily routine. And for the entire year of 2016, um, I said those mantras every morning on the way into work. So seven in the morning, I had 10 minutes of straight my voice mantras that really put me in the right frame of mind to start to believe them. And once you start habits like that, positive ones they they can lock in after three weeks and vice versa when you have some negative self-talk or some negative habits doesn't take long for those to lock in Mm -hmm. so i've actually the other thing i've been doing recently is i i chart all my habits um my sweet sweet uh astrological mother blames it on my progress moon going into taurus which is all a whole nother woo woo stuff but uh, a buddhist monk friend of mine i saw his his journal one day and he had like a bunch of lines and different things and he was charting all the different things that he did during the month and one thing that helps me with self-love is reminding myself what i'm all about so if i say we're in a conversation and i say yeah i meditate all the time and then i go back and look at my chart uh, which has like meditation AM, meditation PM, check mark, check mark, all the days of the month, and I'm tracking this. If I got like fucking five, five morning meditations of the month, how can I, with any, you know, mm-hmm. conviction, say, oh yeah, I meditate all the time? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So what am I actually about? You know, who am I to myself? Who am I saying that I am? And how much of those things match up has really been helpful to me. Um, there's gentleness in that because you're going to fuck up. You're not going to do everything that you want to do, but also it helps me from a discipline standpoint to lock in these habits that I want to have. And it's everything from oil pulling, uh, in the morning at night, coconut oil. Yeah. Yeah. To, uh, you know, meditations daily to how many coffees I had in a day to, uh, whether or not I took my vitamins to, uh, my meditation schedule, um, on and on and on. There's about 35 different things I try and be about, but it's really helped me to lock in good habits and then to be authentically myself, you know? So I'm in a conversation and I'm not bullshitting because it sounds like Mm. what I want to be about. Mm. It's like, well, who are you actually, 
uh, who are you at your core? Here's uh, you know, here's the data to show, you know, and, uh, and we're almost to the end of March right now. So it's, I've only been doing this for a few months, but it's been fun to kind of track, um, you know, how much of these, uh, these things I say I want to be about that I've actually done little things like uh, touching the sand or going in the ocean or mm. uh, swimming. Cause I enjoy swimming as cardio to, um, using, you know, uh, glasses at night, to, to block the, the blue light, you know, just little mm-hmm. things that I want to kick in and, and it all helps me. It's a good practice in self-love because if I do it, I'm like, fuck yeah, look at you, look what you did. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. if I don't do it, it's like, okay, let's be better. But you got, I can practice gentleness on myself, which, uh, has always helped me, um, you know, kind of fall deeper and in, into that unconditional self-love. Yeah. That gentleness sometimes is, is, well, I'd say most of the time, not really taught, you know, because no. in, in coaching and sports and athletics, it's like, you have to be better. You have to be better. But like that gentleness and man, it's such a lesson to be your own best friend. And I've never minded being hard coached. Like mm-hmm. I've never minded somebody sure. jump on my ass getting on me. Yeah. 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 Um, because the perfectionist, you're doing that to yourself more times than your coach could ever do that. Mm-hmm. But there also needs to be a, a good helping of that self love, gentleness, forgiveness for yourself. Like I said, like like you would give a best friend. Yeah. You know, because how you treat your best friend is you should treat yourself as good or better. Caddy for yeah. yourself. Yeah. I try to I try to do that <laughs> on the course one. sometimes yeah. because like I would never if I was caddying for, for you, yeah. I would never say what the fuck was that? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. You know, right. like, like you suck. Sure. Like idiot. No, like yeah. never. So it's, man. yeah, you'd be positive. You'd be encouraging. Yeah. You'd Come be, on, man. You got this. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. Six no, more no holes. That's yeah, 34 of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Same thing in life. So much of that too has come back to, you know, leading yourself. Right. And, you know, you've been in what's arguably probably some of the most masculine rooms in the world, the NFL locker room now for, you know, 20, I don't know how long you've been, what, how many? This will be 20, yeah. 20 years, right? Yeah. And, um, and a leader in those locker rooms, a quarterback, you know, you were, you were behind one of the great leaders in Brett Favre for years and three years in Green Bay and then beyond after that. And I'm curious though, how have the conversations that you've heard in these locker rooms changed over years? Has the more softness, you know, come as you've led in that way? Or how have you heard kind of the masculine energy shifting in these locker rooms? I would just say in general, a lot, a lot has shifted yeah. um, as we've moved into this hyper technological age. When I first got in the locker room, it was dominoes and cards and backgammon that guys are playing. Now it's everybody's on their phones. You got to find new ways to connect to people. Um, I always enjoy the opportunity to look for um, a deep conversation at work, to look for a guy who may be struggling, a guy who maybe is by himself and doesn't feel as connected. Part of the role of the leader is to bring everybody along. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Mm-hmm. There's little things you can do, uh, remembering, uh, names, uh, loved ones, kids, birthdays, mm-hmm. uh, nicknames, you know, mm-hmm. having that personal connection between you and that one person where you can walk by and say a nickname and just like elicit a smile from that person. But, we're all going through this experience, whether we're alpha male in the locker room or somebody, you know, accountant sitting at their desk, we want to be seen and understood Mm -hmm. at our core. Mm -hmm. I really, really believe that. And to be able to see and understand somebody, a lot of times you got to listen and we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So I try and, uh, use my ears as much as possible and get into these conversations with these guys and allow these guys to talk. Sure. Um, the more they talk, the more comfortable they'll, they'll feel because they'll feel seen and you got to listen, you know, and I'm not like taking notes about this person's life, but I'm taking mental notes about like how this person feels talking about certain things, what's important to them. Um, I think that's an important part of the leadership role and getting guys to open up and feel comfortable and, and being a man is talking about your feelings and we don't <laughs> actually get taught that. I don't think mm-hmm. a lot growing up, there's a lot of stigma around like you gotta be strong and never cry and be the protector and provider. And those things are great. There's a lot of beauty in that. And, and chivalry is very important, but mm-hmm. I'm a sensitive guy. And for a long time, sensitivity has been like a negative connotation to, Oh, you don't be so sensitive. It's like, I'm a deep feeler and so many people are as well and creating environments and conversations 
um, whether it's at the lunch table, sitting in the locker room, bullshitting in the huddle, TV timeout in a real game, just dropping in is so fun because seeing guys feel seen and understood allows us all to just coalesce and come together and get that chemistry. And, and the bonds that we take with us are really the most important and longest lasting thing. At some point, most people besides myself, because my memory is what it is, are going to forget about stats and games and scores and different things. But they're not going to forget about the way you made them feel. <laughs> they're not going to forget about uh, uh, some of the dinners that you have, the O-line dinners, the O-line trips, the the fun outings that you do, the birthday parties, the Christmas parties, the Halloween parties, the Thanksgiving that I've hosted at my house over the years. Some of my closest friends in the entire world and people I've I could call in a second and they I know they drop everything to help me out have been guys I played with mm. big strong alpha male guys from every walk of life every color every creed um, every belief system and I'm so thankful for that but it takes you know being intentional about connecting with people and it's the same thing in a medicine journey you you go in with an intention and it it doesn't have to be like specific. Like I need this to happen. Every time I go on and say, Oh, I'm going to do this and call this person. It never happens. But I have intention of like being present. You know, I'm going to be present today uh, with my teammates. And that's what, that's what I do now is when I'm driving to work, I think like I want to impact one person today. I want to have one deep okay. conversation with somebody. If I do that. It's a great day. Yeah. So just like be alert, be present, be off my phone as much as possible watch the body language of, of individuals keep your you know your hand on the pulse of the team and find a way to have an impact on somebody's life and i don't say that self-serving or narcissistically i say that because mm -hmm. when i was a young player there were multiple people who would probably never remember the conversations it, it was a throwaway probably at times to them but they may have said one thing to me that stuck with me and comes to mind uh, at various times throughout my life on or off the field um, that I'm so thankful for. So you never know what is going to be that one thing you say to somebody that's going to click for them. Mm -hmm. Can you share And their whole life. Um, Jeff Tedford, I was sitting in his office. This was when I was in college. Um, I had a rough day of practice. I got into it with like an upperclassman. Um, he, he kind of said something to me. I said something back to him. And it's like this weird situation. I was fighting for a job and I came in and he called me to his office and I was kind of emotional and going through it. And he just said, again, this could be just a, a total throwaway. He could have just been trying to pump me up, but he said, I need you to take a breath mm. and remember you are going to have a great career here. And then you're going to go on and have a great career in the NFL. Wow. And I don't know what it was. And it kind of gives me chills to think about, cause I remember that moment so clearly and he probably doesn't remember that. It wasn't like a core memory for him, which it, I understand it wouldn't be. It, mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect it to be. But for me, it's like one of those seminal moments where I'm like, this dude believes in me. Yeah. And if Jeff Tedford, brilliant mind, genius mind, incredible teacher of the game, incredible play caller, if this guy believes in me, why the fuck can I not believe in myself? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's those moments. Wow. There's so many guys when I was a when I was a rookie and the Packers took care of me. Guys you never even know, you know, lend me their car or pat me on the back with uh, you know, a nice message. Say, Hey, hang in there, kid, you're gonna be fine. You know, you're gonna figure this out. The 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 hours and hours I spent with Tom Clements watching film and going through things and and the the just to get the occasional like a great throw or smile from Tom, because Tom's a very stoic man. Like those moments meant the world to me as a young player to go, this guy believes in me. Mm. Joe Philbin came back from the Pro Bowl. Joe was our offense coordinator after 07. And he goes, I'll tell you what, we were at the Pro Bowl and there was three quarterbacks there and you're better than all three of them. Yeah. And whether Joe was 100% serious in that, 75% yeah. serious, 50% serious, I don't know what it was, but the fact that he said that mm. meant so much to me confidence-wise. And so you never know what is going to be the thing that can just change it slightly, just slight course correction. And in our business, when so many people are so talented, it just sometimes comes down to the mental fortitude, mm. the confidence, the self-belief, the self-love. Mm -hmm. You never know. You have the your words or spells, right? They have the power to 
to be casted for good or not. (laughs) But there's a reason that words are put together an arrangement of letters spelled a certain way. Um, So how are we using our words every day? Man, I saw this thing about how the alphabet and letters were created from the constellations and how there's 24 certain constellations that made the letters and therefore, I mean, it's just all interconnected. And as you said, it like speaking languages, putting a spell spelling right on, on what your, your outcome, your manifestation is going to be your, your energy into the world, the vibration that you put out in the world, because what we're speaking right now, like it's just sounds that somehow we've learned to understand. You know, if you think about it, like we're just making (laughs) random sounds, you know, and, and that's literally vibrating out into infinity. And it's, uh, it's wild to, to break that down and how just some vibrations can change your projection and perspective on life. It's, uh, it's wild. I love, I love having deep conversations to that allow you to think and allow you to open up and be curious. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an amazing book called the noticer. Um, that's about perspective. Have you read it? No, it's incredible. That's a good one. Short read, but just fun read. Great about perspective. Um, what's a, a perspective that has changed or opened for you in your years in the NFL? I mean, there's a lot. It's hard to choose just <laughs> just one I'm perspective. Sure. Um, uh, a lot of it is, you know, and I'm beating the proverbial battered and bruised and potentially dead horse here, but uh, at the root of all my growth is self-love. And that usually follows some sort of ego death. Mm-hmm. So... Every time I've been able to remake myself, it has come after a major cost. And some of those are minor. Some of those are minor that we make bigger. And some of those are large, seem large. Um, Some of those are slights, real slights. Some of those are perceived slights. Some of those are made up. (laughs) Um, But it all, I think, begins with an adjustment of the ego now that can be eating humble pie that can be a total ego death Mm. uh, and rebirth but what follows that is that self-love so for me there was a lot of different things high school being passed over i thought uh um, being passed over in the draft and not and not getting picked as high as i thought i was going to get picked massive humble pie massive ego death Mm. um and on the other side of that, learning who I was without that, whatever it is, that outcome that I thought was going to happen, that I was so set on, um, and being rigid in my ability to adapt and adjust and still find self-love and still find a purpose and, and trusting the universe and trusting that all things are working together for me uh, as I'm a participant in life, mm-hmm. uh, not that life is happening to me, that I'm participating mm-hmm. with it. Um, injuries have been major, you know, parts of that this last year, you know, it was, um, it's been a wild year for me. I did a darkness retreat. I came out of the darkness. Um, and basically my time in Green Bay was up and I did, uh, ayahuasca. And then a week later I got traded to the jets and I have this incredible off season experience in a new city, in a new town with new teammates, a new organization, an owner for the first time. And really falling back in love with a game that I first fell in love with when I was five years old. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful and special and <laughs> deep and rich and yummy and just uh, <laughs> incredible. And then one of the most heartbreaking nights of my life mm. when I played four plays. Mm. Um, talk about an ego death. Um, that's what it was. And... I think a lot of that was kind of came full circle with this, this last ceremony to be able to put that chapter to bed 
Uh, I was in ceremony. Uh, the finalized ceremony was six months to the day of my surgery on my Achilles. And so much change in those six months. Mm -hmm. And I'm repeating a lot of the same concepts because this is my process. And also, I just firmly believe in this idea that if we want to change uh, our truth and our reality, we got to change our perspective. And I was heartbroken on September 11th in the locker room thinking my career might be over. Mm. And that's how I'm going to go out. And after all the beauty in the summer and hard knocks and a new team and mm. just being in New Jersey and the excitement, talking with our amazing fan base and just feeling just the, the energy and the momentum building and then that. Um, I look back now and so much changed in my life for the better. Hmm. Um, and I often have a hard time with people who say, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just got to trust it. Sometimes I call bullshit on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> part of it is the ego wanting things to, yeah. to, little be, to just be a little bit easier sometimes. Hmm. But just like so many things had to happen for me to be sitting right here today with the, with the both of you. So much changed in my life in the last six months that would not have happened had I not been carted off that field on September 11th after one of the highest highs in my sporting career, running on the field oh. on 9-11 mm. with an American flag, which flag. I had never done in my life. Um, I'd always just run out, you know, my helmet, to my low fives to run the field on a special day when our country, uh, you know, 23 years ago went through, uh, um, 22 years ago, went through some major tragedy it was uh, really special. And then for it all to be taken away. But only in that has all this beauty been able to happen in the last six months. So how can I not be grateful hmm. to the universe? Uh, she is a uh, beautiful teacher. Not always easy. Not always <laughs> easy. But the signs and synchronicities are everywhere. And the whispers from the universe and from our ancestors are everywhere. Mm -hmm. If we can just be present mm -hmm. in this moment and open our ears sometimes close our eyes and just remember what we're focusing on because that informs our reality and that informs our truth and so much happened in my life the last six months that never would have happened had I been healthy so I can't I wish things had been different for myself for the organization for our fans for so many players I love playing with but I'm also very grateful for the, the many lessons and the, once again, the ego death <laughs> and the phoenix rising from the ashes, um, a better version of myself. I think I, I, even the way you just described it these few times, and I mean, first off before that, like, thank you for running through that. That was just, yeah. you can feel the emotion again, the love that uh, just clearly just bleeds right through. And I mean, I, it was just special to listen to you walk through that, and I appreciate you saying all that. Um, but it gave me even a deeper definition of the term ego death while you were describing it, because that's a term that you, at least I, I started to hear for the first time when I became you know deeper friends with Morgan and I started exploring you know, plant medicine with him. That term came up, and I'd never heard it before. Um, so specifically, what, what does an ego death mean? To you guys i mean you gave an, an explanation of it there but more simply put what is what does an ego death mean yeah. ready to go <laughs> <laughs> i think it's it's just a it's a realization that who you are cannot survive anymore who you are in this moment does not serve you anymore and you can no no longer rely on um, the way you view yourself in this moment to be able to grow on the other side. Um, it's the identity that you deem yourself as or of. Uh, it's it's the limitations that you put on yourself. That's exactly what it is, basically. Yeah. So it's like it's like okay, I can't, I cannot 
whether it's a decision or something that happened or something that's happening, uh, you cannot live on like that. So like you have to break the barriers, whether you do it through mantras or, or new habits or uh, a trauma um, or a plant medicine ceremony. Um, yeah, the, the ego death is just, it's like a, what we were talking about earlier. It's a caterpillar turning into cocoon, turning into a butterfly. And it doesn't only happen once. It could never happen, I guess, if you don't um, open yourself or are curious about um, more like the, the humanoid natural being uh, and the access that we have to the universe and the, the vastness that we actually are. Um, and just understanding that we, we only use or util, utilizing 20% of our brain. It's mm -hmm. like, there's so much more capacity that we have and it's not, we're not just this body, you know, we're not even the voice. We're not even our thoughts. Like it's beyond that. I was, I think it was in untethered soul, the book, him explaining that you're not even the voice inside your head. You're, you're that thing that's listening to that mm -hmm. you're not your body you're not your voice you're not your thoughts you're it's your you're you're everything you're this that's why death to me shouldn't be scary like it is because it just it is but like the ego death feels like a true death like it's it's scary but it's the most beautiful thing because there's bliss on the other side is it, is it almost like a death of your understanding in some way? Like uh, almost the walls we talked about earlier? Like, I think it's a, it's a, yeah, I think it's a death of self limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. Which is the only thing that can stop a caterpillar from opening its wings and flying. I mean, it has, you know, just in this, I mean, the caterpillar to the butterfly has been a, a big part of my uh, last few weeks. There was kind of a, a spoken word song that came to me before my ceremony. And the one thing I love about this spoken word is that it talks about the butterfly is actually the caterpillar living out its absolute wildest dreams. Oh. And we forget that there actually isn't two different species organisms a caterpillar and a butterfly obviously there's been a metamorphosis in the cocoon in the chrysalis but it's a caterpillar that's living out its wildest dreams it comes out of the cocoon and it just innately know like just trusts like that's the <laughs> that's ego so death epic. i'm no longer a fucking caterpillar like sorry i'm no longer bound by these you know many legs and the fact that i'm just going to walk on this plant like a a ton of different predators that can get me from above. No, no. Now I can explore the air, the skies, the trees, the I can flowers. Fly. I can yeah. fly. <laughs> but right before that moment where the caterpillar opens its wings and leaps, that's that moment of self-doubt, of self-limited belief system that you have to push through. And that's, and that's, that's when the ego dies and it gets reborn because just like death is just another step in the journey when you say ego death it's a transformation hmm. it's a transformation a metamorphosis into a different perspective a different way of living a different um relationship with your body with your mind with your beliefs um so yeah i've been i've been on this caterpillar <laughs> butterfly thing for the last few weeks <laughs> it's an amazing analogy of life yeah, it's, no, it's an amazing definition, and it, it, I appreciate each of you guys walking through it. I mean, it it feels like, you know, kind of we've talked about this, and, and it's been a hot topic around the world, but it's it feels like post-COVID there has been this greater awakening to minds and the way that things always were. Um, and it, it's almost like the way it was just described definitionally, it's like there's a larger ego death going on. Mm. You know, there's a lot going on in COVID. <laughs> a lot going on. I hope I hope 
I hope we're waking up. I really do. I hope we're waking up and realizing our power and and uh, and our purpose. Um, and we approach, you know, each day with an intention to to do better. That's what you know. The world is a little crazy. If you watch the news, it's way way crazy. Mm-hmm. If you don't, because it's all propaganda anyway, you you have a different perspective on on life in the world, and, and you travel around and meet people that go to Costa Rica. I fucking love Costa Rica. And people are incredible and beautiful and kind and loving. And I've had that experience in, we are talking in, in New Zealand, New in, Zealand. in Australia, and real. in India, and yeah. in Africa, um, and in Europe. Like beautiful people loving to connect. And during COVID, there were like a lot of lines drawn in the sand. You know, a lot of sides being taken up. Yeah. But true definition of polarity there's a difference between polarity and duality duality is the idea that uh, things are separate polarity is the understanding the gnosis that is actually part of the same pole right part of the same stick there's two sides of the same stick but in essence we're the same and the more that we look for differences and, and bring in duality and dichotomy into the world the more we find ways to to separate ourselves from each other but when we're out there i see more people trying to connect more people with a uh, you know a heart open to learn uh, more people questioning things mm-hmm. more people looking at life mm. to cure, through a curious lens what I think mm-hmm. is really really important and I'm actually encouraged I mean people there's definitely some people who are doomsday prepping not just the uh, super wealthy but the people who believe that there's some inevitable end uh, I happen to believe in in, uh, in humanity and, and people and um, I hope that messages uh, of love and, and uh, like what you guys are spreading on this show, the conversations, long form conversations is the way mm. of uh, the future. And mm-hmm. obviously with what Joe's doing on his podcast and a lot of people are doing, having these long discussions, that's how you change the world, not by watching propaganda on mm-hmm. either of the main two networks uh, and just finding ways to get out of each other's throats and the, how different we are we're actually very very similar yeah we got to remember that and it's, there's certain people in charge that don't want us to to connect with each mm-hmm. other so true I, I remember when we had first released the podcast and i was playing golf with with a kid one day and uh, uh, actually i had just met him he was a mutual friend and we were playing golf and he happened to watch our you know uh, one of our shows and he asked me a great question, which I, which I hadn't been asked to that point, which was, what do you hope people walk away with when they listen to the show? I kind of sat there for a minute because I hadn't really thought about it, and each episode's a little different. But to that point, we'd interviewed uh, Jack and Luke Donald and Ricky and Kelly Gores and just, you know, our first handful episodes. And, and I thought, uh, I said, you know, rightly so, we put so many of these people on pedestals for their accomplishments and these incredible things they, they've achieved in their life. But one of the things I hope people walk away from in our conversations is they're just humans like you and me. Mm-hmm. And the humanity in these conversations mm-hmm. really reflects just that. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, you know, man, I, I, uh, I hope that our world can continue to live with some more humanity for one another because we're all in this thing together. And uh, I, I'd never heard that definitional difference between polarity and duality before. That is really interesting. Yeah. I, you said it so well. It's it's when you travel and you're not watching the news and you're yeah. not watching all the fear put out there on the television. There's so many beautiful people who want to help others or who are trying to learn. And that's what I love about Nosara is like you go there, you sit in a restaurant and you talk to the people sitting next to you. Mm-hmm. Like people aren't, yeah, maybe they're on their phones answering some emails, but like if someone, a family is next to you or, it's just like an openness and and a curiosity when we first moved there and we were out at a restaurant like I invited these people sitting next to me over to our house and told them where I lived after an hour of knowing them in the states you don't even want to tell anyone where you live remotely like you know going past someone on on the streets of New York City you're just you feel more alone than like being alone and it's true like there's so much good out there there's so much beautiful there's so much beauty in the world and Mm -hmm. yeah i hope people can see that and 
it's um it's nice to feel others in in the positions and platforms that that you have doing the same thing and and preaching um natural life and and one love and that we're all the same it's just uh it gives it gives me hope it's exciting yeah and i mean you 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 talk about the beauty and love that you feel in costa rica and and i've certainly felt it too there but i mean you know within this country here in the united states there's an incredible amount of that here too Mm -hmm. you know and it's disguised by the propaganda that we see on on the networks most days but you know within the country we call home like there's all those same feelings are here too oh, yeah and i think there's a deep calling inside of so many people that want to feel that connection again and you know aaron obviously you've been you know somewhat political and and have you know described where your feelings have lied at times and i'm curious for you you know what what kind of message or what kind of um how how do you feel that we can unite people again in this country to be proud to be Americans? Well, you have to have a field of value first. You have to, I think, one issue with um, some of the common sentiment uh, in society, and especially in places like college campuses, is there's we are lacking a field of value where there are uh, truths. There are uh, objective truths about this world that can be guides for us on our path. And if nothing matters, nothing is real, nothing is, there's, you know, there's no truth in the world. Love doesn't matter. Uh, Freedom of speech is dangerous. Uh, We're all separated by color, political ideology religious ideology uh, wealth Mm. whatever it might be all the ways that they separate us um, there's no humanity left Mm. there's not because we've taken a machete to eight different ways to slice each other up and Mm. to create separation between us we've forgotten um, the basic uh, you know, final word usually in yoga, which is namaste, right? It's an understanding of the beauty and the light in you that I see that's reflected back to me. Mm -hmm. Um, We can't even find commonality with people because we live in an echo chamber of identity politics and and we're all guilty of it in some way, Mm -hmm. you know, myself included. Um, But we got to talk more. We got to talk more to each other. We need to listen to each other even more than talk to each other. We need to find ways to to find common ground on, on things that uh, that break us apart. I think, if anything, COVID has showed us, you know, who some of the real enemies are. And I think it's not that hard to see unless you're blinded by your own captured nature, um, that there are people who do not want you to live out a life that... Uh, was outlined in the Constitution, you know, the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Mm. Like life in general, there's people who don't want certain people to live. That's pretty obvious. Liberty, we forget this country was formed as a constitutional republic, not a democracy. Democracy strives for equality and we'll never get it. Democracies always fall into tyranny. Constitutional republic is based on civil liberties, right? personal freedoms right that's how this country was formed and and we're one of the few countries in the world with clearly defined personal liberties there's 10 of them to start the constitution they're called the bill of rights they're mm-hmm. all very 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 important and there's a reason that each one of those was put into place and the first one is probably the most important one because it gives outlines freedoms of speech religion assembly um, among other things and that has been under attack mm-hmm. and I'm reading a book finishing a book called The Coddling of the American Mind yep. phenomenal book it's about what's happened on college campuses yeah. uh, creating safe spaces weaponizing words uh, outlawing, dis- out- outlawing dissenting opinions none of that is good for any type of growth for society 
and um, some of that seems like we're way too far down the line uh, and who knows if we can get some of that back mm -hmm. but I do know that uh, if you're not trying to find any commonality with people then there will always be division but if you're curious and you're a critical thinker and you're open minded um, and you hold on to your own personal truths loosely right? the greatest wisdom is held uh, by the you know, most gentle, loosest, simplest way, right? I always say that the the deepest wisdom is the simplest wisdom, mm -hmm. right? Explain to me like I'm a two-year-old, mm -hmm. and I bet you you can find some wisdom in there. The greatest wisdom keepers that I know, and I just met one in this last ceremony, but I also know uh, a, a man I refer to as Dr. Dan, mm. uh, who you know, who's been in ceremony, Um he is a, an incredible wisdom keeper, and he holds it so gently, yeah. so loosely. Um, smartest person in the room is not always the loudest one. <laughs> um, and I think that we, uh, in a, a deep desire to be right, which the desire behind that is just to be seen and understood, which I mentioned earlier is a core of all of our, you know, uh, it's all of our wounds, I think. Mine, for sure, speaking personally, is when I'm not seen and understood, that's a wound. You know, that's a trigger for me. So how do we see and understand people? I think we, we're curious. We listen. Yeah. Uh, we create dialogue. And then we figure out what our perspective is. And, and, and then we inform our reality. And then we take some truths away about how we can actually change this world. And it starts with love. It starts with loving people, loving ourselves, and forgiving ourselves. How can we forgive people that we don't agree with or that have wronged us if we can't forgive ourselves? It's not yeah. possible. Yeah. It's like, how can we love other people in an unconditional way if we can't give it to ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, it's stuff that I haven't totally figured out that I'm <laughs> constantly working on. But um, I think that it's clear and not a conspiracy um, that there are powers that be that do not want this world to be connected and do not want, um, you know, the power and the healing power of plant medicine to go mainstream. Mm -hmm. Graham Hancock said on, on Rogan, he doesn't believe anybody should be allowed to do politics unless, unless they've had <laughs> multiple uh, plant medicine ceremonies. And I tend to believe it because oh, yeah, be I don't know anybody that I've sat in ceremony with, that's done medicine, that, that's in my life, that uh, that's living this way, that wants to, you know, control, manipulate, uh, you know, battle, war, yeah. uh, you know, censor, cancel, shut up, uh, name call other people. It's just not a way that that, that those people live. Yeah. Um, it's not their kind of their fallback. Obviously, mm -hmm. we all have our moments, but like. Think about if the people who were in charge of this shit actually like sat in an ayahuasca ceremony, you, <laughs> had a communion with grandmother, yeah, or did a bufo ceremony, yeah, and saw and met God, or it's only fifteen minutes. Yeah, I mean, I think the world would look a little bit differently. But but what do we do? We outlaw and demonize and yep. and vilify mm -hmm. medicines that expand your mind, that makes you question your reality, that mm -hmm. make you. Uh, feel way more connected uh, but we don't vilify or condemn or outlaw or ban substances drugs mm -hmm. right not just pharmaceuticals but like things like alcohol, alcohol yeah. that keep you in lower chakras that keep you disconnected that keep you in zombie mode easily controlled easily controlled and they have nothing to do with health mm -hmm. like we're a fucked up health wise country you know like, just talk to RFK about it. You know, the chronic disease levels is unbelievable, starting with kids. Mm -hmm. um, until that changes, we're going to... It's going to be some tough sledding for, for us. But I still have hope. I really, I really do. Hope is a memory of the future. And I'm going to hold on to that and believe that the people are going to keep waking up and that the powers of be went a little bit too far mm -hmm. with COVID. Mm -hmm. And people are questioning things more and connecting more yeah well i i think they said like they say wait till the next one you know like those have been words out of i'll leave the names unnamed but 
some people listening will know who I'm talking about. Uh, like, I think if there is a next one, I don't think there'll be the leniency of the masses of what I, I'm hopeful because of what happened. There'll still be the people driving in their cars with masks on. <laughs> like yeah, they are unfortunately. Now. I think this is such a fascinating year, though. This yeah, is, is. Yeah, a, is a charged up year, not just because we have an election, but there's already been a lot of disclosures and stuff that's going on. There's mm-hmm. a famous rapper who's in the crosshairs mm-hmm. right now for mm-hmm. some real wild allegations. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's potentially a lot of people involved in that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've talked at length about wanting more transparency on the Epstein case mm-hmm. because him and Ghislaine Maxwell have uh, you know, been convicted for trafficking minors to absolutely nobody. We have no list. That's I think nuts. it's important that we root out that stuff, especially with the most uh, at risk and the, and the most sensitive and the, and the best of us, mm. you know, humanity, the children. The we gotta protect so the, we got to protect the children. Yes. And I think this is going to be a year of disclosure and there's going to be more and more things that come out that start to break that invisible cabal down and as it does i think you're going to see the planet heal the people heal and i'm confident i I feel you know i feel really confident maybe it's false hope but i believe in people and i believe in uh in this planet i believe this universe wants to work um in our favor and whatever god you choose to pray to believe in like we're all uh ultimately on the same team I think a word that I've seen come up a lot in the last two, three years that people are getting more uh, drawn to is community. Yeah. Like everyone is like, oh, let's just get all of our friends and buy some land and have our own community and grow our own food. And like, I've heard people say that, that I would have never thought would say that Mm. five years ago. And that's really cool because having a daughter now and realizing that you can't raise a child on your own that you can't like the mother and the father like of course you can but like when you have a community with you or around you that can truly help and aid and help grow and educate it's just it feels right and i think ultimately everybody kind of knows that yeah i agree um and that's what we need. We need we need conscience, conscious parents raising conscious children mm-hmm. to make this place uh, better. Mm-hmm. And so there's some dropping birth rates, but we need people to, you know, like yourself, to have, have some kids, raise them the right way. <laughs> and the more conscious people we have in this world, the better chance we have of saving it from the people that... Uh, don't want everybody to wake up Mm -hmm. it's true i was in um new york a couple months ago and went and saw the play hamilton for the first time it's amazing i literally have never felt more proud to be an american in my life than when i walked out of that theater (laughs) like it was such a heroic story and it was such a human story i mean hamilton this incessant journaler right and through all his fears which you are yeah i mean it was just it was like Mm-hmm. But it was so patriotic, mm-hmm. you know, it was, I, I left there literally feeling so proud to be an American and then walked out with my best friend, Sean, to, you know, uh, Times Square. And like, it was just, it was this all time moment. <laughs> but, um, and I know you're, you're a lover of arts too. And I think one thing I'd share in common and what you shared earlier is, is definitely being an emotional person, you know, that, that loves uh, music or theater or, you know, whatever it is that brings the emotion out of you. I, I've, I've said this to you a few times lately, like, I feel like the world needs another great peace music movement like the 60s was, you know, mm. with these great peace bands that brought people together through words of love and, you know, peace together. Like it just, music's such an inspiring thing, mm. you know? We need some inspiring music to come out in this world. I could not agree with you anymore. Yeah. The movement uh, has to involve the arts. Yeah. We need to make movies, songs, art plays uh that show a beautiful world that we all know is possible that's cool and there's way too many predictive films out there (laughs) predictive programming subliminal messaging by you know 
by Hollywood and its constituents, um, we need to we need to tell the story again. Every great civilization uh, had a mythos, right? They had mm-hmm. myths that uh, informed their lives, and whether it was deities that they prayed to, uh, going back to you know ancient times um, around. Uh, uh, fertility, the fertility cults. There's a great book by um, uh, John Allegro about that called The Mushroom, Sacred Mushroom of the Cross. I'm reading that right now. Oh, are you really? Oh, yeah, my God. It's fantastic. I need a thesaurus, though, dude. To get oh, through. I know. It's, it's like unbelievable. So dense. It's very so, dense. Yeah. But we need we need a new myth. And I think part of that is, I realize it, I love, you know, sci-fi movies. I love Lord of the Rings. I love, love, love Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> I grew up watching Star Wars. But what do we love about those movies is there's there's heroes in it yep. for one, and there's people who believe in something greater than themselves, and they put their lives, their livelihood, on the line. And also there's community, right? Mm-hmm. There's that bond, exactly. like with the Guardians have that bond, the um, the Rebels in in Star Wars have that bond, the Nine who set out from Rivendell in Lord of the Rings. Like there's just something about this that's so relatable. It's people, men and women, laying on the line, believing in something greater than themselves, mm-hmm. and willing to to die for what they believe in. Um, and that's how you change culture. And those are we need a new a new mythos that uh, that gives us the hope um, that we are powerful beyond measure. You know, mm-hmm. one of my favorite quotes of all time is from Coach Carter when he keeps asking. You know, what's your deepest fear? What's your deepest fear? What's your deepest fear? And finally, after they decide, you know, they open up the gym, the lockout's over. Coach Carter's ways don't matter. He walks in the gym, uh, you know, to see the boys and they're studying. And they're not going to play because they believe in the coach. And Coach Carter gets really emotional. It's a very emotional time. Mm -hmm. And I actually usually cry when I watch this, but... He's been asking the uh, Mexican kid over and over, what's your deepest fear? What's your deepest fear? And then he quotes this powerful poem, um, uh, which he basically says, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. It's that we're powerful beyond measure. And if we could embrace that, um, we could change the world. I didn't understand that for the longest time, and I need to watch that movie again. But it's funny. I was having a conversation. We went camping the other night, and we were just going deep, and it was it was beautiful. Uh, but we were asking each other our deepest fears, and for the longest time, I always said I had no fears, and. I don't know if it was an ego thing or just not giving myself enough time to, to self-reflect or meditate or really f- answer them. But it was, I finally found out that it's for me is to reach my full potential because I'm scared of what that could be because I know that it could not be something that can be described as like human even um and i don't think it's even could be in this lifetime and it's just like how do i comprehend that how do i grasp onto that how do i understand and so now i've I've been on this journey of like deep deep comprehension or deep uh contemplation contemplation yeah. thank you um and it's been it's been really fun but but scary at the same time and it's kind of a cool place to to be in but um one of the things that i have written down here or what are your or what is one of your biggest fears other than sharks yeah sharks and heights <laughs> for sure um, well no you had shark week so yeah, yeah i'm better i'm good. better with it i'm better with it i still feel like there's a shark out there it's got my name on it. but <laughs> face head down when we get there actually i was doing a would you rather game the other day get uh bitten or attacked by an anaconda or a shark and i chose shark yeah I, anaconda i don't know I, can, I, mean, like, <laughs> I mean i watched anaconda starring you know 
J Lo and Ice Cube yeah. and John Boyd. <laughs> Uh, movie doesn't stand up, but um, <laughs> uh, test of time. But uh, scary, very scary. I don't know that the anacondas can actually move that fast, but uh, definitely uh, would rather take my chances in the water with sharks. But um, yeah, you know what? I think uh, I think it, it. A lot of my my fears, you know, I, I've been able to assuade them by. A deeper sense of self-love so that rewriting the idea of success has been huge because my fear was um, not accomplishing what I know I'm capable of accomplishing but what is my perspective and like what happened in a IS ceremony night one a few years back and what I was when you were talking what I would say to you what I would ask you is do you feel like you're worthy to be loved if you fail to meet that expectation of that fear are you still lovable yeah yeah so what is the fear then if that is the if the truth on the other side is yeah still lovable is that actually a fear anymore it's a goal maybe yeah it's it's just but you're re you're changing the words right yeah mm-hmm. Two very different words. It's the un- yeah. it's the unknown, I guess. Which uh, it's the same quote I've said a hundred times now. It's like in the unknown, there are endless possibilities. Yeah, I think my biggest fear is, is losing presence and and not mm-hmm. becoming the best version of myself mm-hmm. and allowing my ego, my pride, my sensitivity, mm-hmm. my insecurity to stop me from living my best life which i believe involves inspiring people mm. and using my platform to uh keep people thinking questioning things yeah, curious yeah, exactly. you know sharing my experience my failures my frustrations my struggles mm-hmm. being trying to be relatable you know how i try and be with my teammates uh I, you know i was telling like i'm telling you this especially in the quarterback room quarterback room yeah. everything i'm i'm telling you i've done and worse <laughs> So everything that you're going to, every failure and mistake you're making, I've done that and more. Yeah. That's how you're relatable. You know, people respond to that relatability. So my biggest fear would be just not living uh, a life that I'll be proud of when I'm 90. Yeah. That's a good one. And, and, and it comes down to being present. Right. Because if I'm present, I'm aware I'm listening to the universe. Yeah. You, you know, I'm listening to the subtle whispers. I'm hearing the ancestral wisdom. You can't do anything more than be present. Yeah. But it's so easy. And let me finish this because it just came up in my mind when you yes, said that. Please. We did a meditation in Costa Rica before we did ceremonies. This was day two. We were there. We were going to drink that night. We did a morning meditation um, that Jordan uh, had on his phone. And it, uh, the thought uh, experiment was um, personify... Uh, fear what does fear feel like to you and for whatever reason what came to my mind was distraction and i thought okay then i so i sat with that for much of the day and and was reflecting and journaling and i realized when fear comes up for me i distract myself so i would distract myself with uh mindless television or uh playing a game on my phone you know doing a crossword when i should be doing something else or um uh, you know anything that takes me off of that thought of the fear but in actuality when you address it when you face it head on like you do in a ceremony where you've surrendered the fear dissipates it's much like in a transcendental meditation um the the conversation is around embracing those thoughts and the more you embrace them and give energy to them they actually dissipate and go away so I try to do the same thing with my fears when they come up instead of like suppressing them or distracting myself because mm-hmm. it's so easy, right? They actually don't go away. They get worse because <laughs> yeah. they're always kind of lingering oh, yeah. under the right. under the skin, uh, down in the, in the belly if you just try and suppress them all the time. So dealing with them in the moment gives me a freedom to like, okay, all right, this is my fear. Rational, irrational, good, bad, indifferent. At if this fear comes true, am I lovable on the other side? It's mm, a great question. Yeah, that is, you're right. It's not the inevitable answer is yes. Yeah. But how can I 
let that sink in. It's the same like desire to have ceremony, headspace, and feeling and love and emotion be the norm, mm. be the be the standard. Can self love that level of self love unequivocally, without a doubt, look in the mirror or look inward mm -hmm. when that fear comes up and go? No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm lovable. I'm enough, even if this happens. Can it's not lovable to others? It's lovable of your, your yeah. yourself. Yeah. I think the word enough is like one of the hardest to define words in the English dictionary. I've struggled with that word yeah. as much or more than anything. Yeah. And definitionally, I think that is about as hard as it gets to really understand what it means to you and beyond. It just, yeah, when you said that enough term, it just, that always comes up for me. Hmm. Yeah, because I think there's some, you know, underlying intrinsic understanding that like, yeah, but. Right. Could I be more? You right. Know? Could I be better than this? Mm. And I think, you know, for successful people, whatever that successful people, for people that are growing all the time, like there is that constant desire to like be better, push my edge in ceremony, push my edge in uncomfortability to find a new facet of my personality that is new and exciting. But it's only going to work if there's perspective of gratitude for that moment going you know what i'm great just the way i am mm. i'm enough right now yeah i want to be more better nicer more present whatever but right now super lovable mm -hmm. that's what we were talking about that with woo today like he's the most comfortable dude <laughs> in his skin yeah he's just like you know what i am i am what i am and i try to be what i want to be for others yeah. You know? And uh, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh what what do you got? No, I just I was thinking about Woo. Woo. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I thought you were saying Was that your first time meeting him today? Yeah, yeah, Woo's. Yeah, he's a legend. He's, he's a, a legend. great dude. He's the best. He lives life pretty much with the onions kinda of down, the layers of the onion. But isn't that what we're drawn to is the yeah. Uh, yeah. Authenticity, authenticity, right? Exactly. Just like Yeah. I, and and sometimes people who are a little bit kinda of like abrasive you know mm -hmm. who we'd love because like they're just always the they're same themselves. person yeah right and, and part of us like damn like that's what i want to be that all yeah. the time yeah. i can just say fuck it you know it's like mark manson's book about the subtle art of not giving a fuck the right. whole mm -hmm. the whole gist of that book is not like i don't give a fuck nothing matters it's no there are things that really matter and that's what i give a fuck about yeah all the other stuff whatever yeah but that actually life matters right because like, i want to be intentional about caring about this shit yeah that's where the auth authenticity comes in You're like oh man i love that this dude's like just the way he is you know and like totally comfortable in his own skin yeah and he's genuine about what he gives a fuck about and it doesn't have to be the same as that you no. care about but it's okay like and that's how you live an inspired life i think yeah inspire the people around you by like oh yeah it's cool to just be yourself yeah Cool to be just myself, weird hippie football player, you know, who loves doing plant medicine and uh, meditating and reading a book and then occasionally playing golf and, <laughs> you know, traveling and meeting people. Like, yeah, it's okay. Sounds yeah. like a good life to it's, me. It starts incredibly young, though. I, I have a nine year old little sister and I had the most incredible moment with her uh, two, two months ago. I found her sitting in my, my room, staying down at my parents' house in Florida and she was down. She had a couple of her best friends. It was her, her ninth birthday. And she was sitting by herself in my room and I walked in there and I started talking to her and I'm very blessed to have a really close bond and connection with her. And, and I asked her what's wrong and it was something surface level at first, wasn't feeling good and kind of, well, what's that feel like? Dove a little deeper with her. And eventually she says to me, I just, I don't feel like I'm cool. <laughs> she's a nine-year-old little girl, right? Yeah. And she's beautiful and she has all these amazing friends and she does sports and all these things. She's electric, right? <laughs> And so I dove in deeper with this to her and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I told her that, that, you know, God innately creates each of us as individuals, you know, for a reason and it's to be ourselves. And she didn't feel like being herself was cool. She wanted to be more like her friend mm. that was doing this or that. And, you know, I'm curious, Aaron, for you in your career, 
and I don't know the answer to this, if, if earlier in your career you were as outspoken, but you know, in these last you know, few years where you really have taken more stances outside of the game of football, has that helped you truly feel like you can be yourself anywhere? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> uh, it's been hard, for sure. Yeah. It's, been, it's been hard. Um, I have felt a responsibility to use my platform to speak up for people who can't. Mm. Um, so it's been very hard. I've lost, obviously, um, uh, you know, friends and sponsorships and different things. And even saying that, you know, pisses people off because I'm, I'm being, you know, uh, you know, not seeing the big picture. And, uh, you know, I realize, you know, people lost their lives with COVID and there was a ton of fear around it. Um, but I really felt like I was speaking out for people who didn't have a voice, who were put on a decision, jab or livelihood, you know, and, mm -hmm. And as much as they want to change and revise the history of what happened, we know what happened. And that's why I keep talking about it is because they're going to try and do it again at some point. And you got to remember how powerful and beautiful and mm. uniquely uh, special each yeah. of us are and uniquely powerful that we are. And we are, we have the potential to be such incredible manifestors of our desires, of our wishes of good in this world. And, when we're kept in the uh, lower chakras, when we're dulled and dumbed down and distracted, it's never going to happen. Um, and this, I've said some dumb things, you know, that I, I wish I hadn't. I've said uh, a lot of things that I feel really confident about. And I stand on everything I've said um, and learn from my mistakes. But there has to be a field of value in this world. There has to be things that are just innately true and good. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep standing up for those and I'm going to make mistakes. You know, I'm going to say things that, that, uh, piss people off or that I could have said in a better way, but, um, I enjoy a good back and forth. I enjoy learning. I, I love reading. Uh, I love, uh, a good conversation with somebody whose opinion that I might not on the surface share and, I love, you know, meeting my teammates from different backgrounds because their experience, their perspective, their reality is so much different than mine. Just how they grew up yeah. and how they view the world. Now, that's that's how we connect. That's how we grow and bond. And it's so fascinating just to listen. Like, mm -hmm. damn, that was your childhood or that was your experience in college or that was your experience in the pros so far. It's beautiful. But there's a lot of people in this world that don't want things to be connected. And I just feel like I've always felt like you got at some point you got to stand up for what you believe in mm. otherwise you'll fall for anything and you know i uh took a tough stand against powers that be in a uh, incredible industrial complex that has zero intention of healing people or making the world better uh pharmacrats in the in the government uh who you know, probably intentionally, uh, you know, let people die. Mm -hmm. Um, and I took a stand against it. I thought it was the right thing to do. And I stand by that decision. Um, I'll keep standing up for the people that can't speak. I'll keep standing up against corruption. Um, you know, I'll make some mistakes along the way, but, uh, my intention is to, uh, to bring more love and hope and, uh, excitement in this world but at the same time you know what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong and there is a field of value i like to play in that world where love actually matters mm -hmm. dignity matters respect mm -hmm. matters and uh in cases where i don't see that and i see corruption i see um you know the uh the most uh delicate in society being attacked over and over kids you know, I'm going to try and stand up for those people and stand up for what's uh, what I believe is right. Not always right about anything. I don't have all the answers. Um, but I do, you know, I do research a lot of stuff, things I believe in, things that question my beliefs. Um, there's both sides that don't like you doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in a religion that didn't like being questioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I always felt like questioning your belief system is how it becomes an innate uh, part of your 
your ideology or you you adjust it that should be how it was you know i said i said a line wasn't my line said science that can't be questioned it isn't science anymore it's propaganda yeah. take science out put government in there right. put military industrial complex mm-hmm. put you know all these different things that uh, are coming at us in life if they can't be questioned then there's something else that's going on and I got a platform to speak some people hate it some people want to shut me up I mean I got mentioned as a finalist to be uh, you know vice president right. on a ticket and they fucking attacked me yeah. with some bizarre story from years ago there was a third hand account or something they're terrified they're terrified of people that think for themselves that aren't controlled mm-hmm. I'm not beholden to anybody I have a contract that can get cut at any point I have very few sponsors now. They're all people that I really believe in, that there's some sort of equity investment Mm -hmm. uh, in it. But I'm not controlled. Nobody controls my messaging. Nobody controls my social media. Nobody can control me. You know, I think for myself. I speak for myself. And that's dangerous to an establishment that wants more power, control, and obedience. And me personally, I'm not ceding any of those to people who don't have my best interest at heart. Mm. Very good. Uh-huh. Good. To that. Man. We yeah. all need to live with that. Yeah, I mean, you can you can obviously feel this strength in you that's growing around these belief systems. And, mm. and I appreciate, you know, being around somebody that stands up for what they believe in, frankly, because uh, there was a long, you know, time period here where we were scared to say what we thought and and it took people like yourself to really stand up and say what they believe in to defy that narrative well there were a lot of really really courageous people yeah who lost their jobs lost their livelihoods lost their businesses Mm -hmm. uh got kicked off of social media i mean bobby got kicked off social media and he's fought against the powers of b his entire life he sued the epa you know countless times and won every single case uh, uh, you know, of corruption, pollution, whatever it was doing, and then got involved in the Children's Health Defense Network and, and help helping, you know, vaccine injury stuff. Um, he's a hero. You know, he stood up time and time again, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people like that who were, you know, heroes in their own way and stood up. But not every, everyone has a platform. Not everyone can go on mm-hmm. Pat McAfee's show whenever they want and talk their shit. You know, and have people listen to it. Yeah. Um, mm. So I, I take that responsibility uh, to heart. I took it to heart when they sent a, a, literally a, a pharma stooge paid by the NFL to come to our team in 2021 and talk to us about vaccine rates and all this other bullshit. And as I'm in this appeal with the NFL, which hinges on them, you know, it doesn't hinge on this, but they called me in the process a conspiracy theorist for insinuating that getting the vaccine, you could still contract and transmit COVID. When literally we had five scouts out day one, all fully vaxxed, had COVID. <laughs> I mean, like what kind of ridiculous backwards world were we living in? Yeah. And still, we haven't quite come out of No one's been held accountable. I mean, read the real Anthony Fauci yeah. by Bobby, Bobby's book. It's fucking unbelievable, and it's the scariest thing ever. And you realize this shit's been going on for decades. Yeah. Read Dissolving Illusions. That's a fantastic book about the history of chronic disease in this country. Mm-hmm. It changes your whole perspective on everything. And Bobby, to his credit, wrote this expose on Fauci, who's been... Like he's the highest paid government official, been in government forever for all these pandemics, and he's been in charge, never held accountable, never held accountable. But everything that Bobby says in the book, if you read the book, it's fucking wild. Yeah. It is wild, crazy information that makes you sick to your stomach, hasn't been sued. Why? It's probably all true, yeah. otherwise, he'd be sued. Yeah. yeah. Like, what are we even talking about here? There's, again, there's a group of people that don't want you to have life, liberty, and pursuit happiness. Right. They don't want you to be healthy 
wealthy and wise wealthy not just i'm talking about monetary sense but mm-hmm. just like a love of life and mm-hmm. community and all the things that we've talked about today and at the same time there's a lot of people a lot of people waking up there is yeah and you talked about the you know time here just recently where you were rumored as a potential vp you know candidate with bobby kennedy um obviously that didn't come to be true in this case with who he announced as his vp but uh, do you see a potential future in politics for yourself? I've always thought politics is a total sham. Um, I did a project on JFK when I was in high school and opened my eyes to what was really going on as I read this, you know, narrative, uh, Warren, the Warren Commission, and was just like, this is bullshit. <laughs> and then as you get deeper into it, you realize he was one of, if not the last true president who fought against the powers that be, who fought against the shadow government, who yeah. fought against the deep state, whatever you want to call it, and was killed for it. Yeah. But not just JFK. People forget. Uh, RFK was killed as well. Mm-hmm. His brother, Bobby Kennedy's father, mm-hmm. was also killed. And he fought against the powers that be as well. And, you know, I'm proud to support Bobby. I think he's an incredible man. I think he has a vision to change the country. Uh, I don't know that it's uh, that easy, but there was just a major change in Argentina. I have a dear friend who's Argentinian, and what's gone on there in a matter of a few months, balancing of the budget, a whole change, and the you know a return of like uh, nationalist pride, Mm -hmm. proud to be an Argentinian. You said it after watching Hamilton. Like, I'm a red-blooded American. Like, yeah. I love this country. My grandfather fought in the Second World War. Like, I've always been a huge supporter in the troops, men and women who are willing to lay their lives on the, lives on the line. Now, some of these wars that we fought are absolutely horseshit, hmm. and, we're, and we're, you know, lying in the pockets of the Lockheed Martins of the world yeah. Yeah. and fighting these proxy wars all over the uh, world, unfortunately. But the fucking men and women in uniform, I love them. And, yeah. And... I get emotional when I hear the national anthem before games. I get emotional when I hear Lee Greenwood's uh, proud to be an American. Mm-hmm. And I think we need a little bit more of that. Like, I think we've lost that, like, appreciation perspective. Like, the, you know, there's a in one of my all time favorite parts of any show that's ever been on. And I, you know, I love The Office and Entourage and Lost <laughs> and Game of Thrones, of course. But there's a, a show called, uh, the newsroom that was on HBO. Mm-hmm. Uh, phenomenal show written by Aaron Sorkin, who's a wordsmith. He's a yeah. genius. And um, the opening scene of the pilot is Jeff Daniels in an auditorium doing a Q&A, and he's oh. the lead anchor. And he basically is, you know, the question from the moderate is, why is America the greatest country in the world? And, um, you know, somebody says freedom and freedom and somebody says, you know, right to vote or I don't care what else somebody else says. And he's trying to, you know, brush it off by saying that the Declaration of Independence is one of the greatest, you know, documents ever written. And the guy's pressing him and pressing him and you yep. a better answer. And he goes, America's not the greatest country in the world. Right. And it kind of goes silent. It's this fucking incredible, like three minute uh, monologue by, by him where he basically lists off the statistics of where we're at in the world. But doesn't just stop there with a negative. He, f- at the end, flips it and goes, but it could be. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. We right. used to dream dreams and build incredible structures and, and you know, change the world and, and believe in the American dream and, and all the stuff that he says. You got to go back and watch the clip. And I actually might tonight because I'm thinking about it. But <laughs> that's what I feel like Bobby can give us is that hope that life can be different. And just the fact that I was mentioned, you know, I'm sure people were like, oh, he has no, you know, political experience. How's that worked out so far? Yeah. How's that worked out in our government? All these fucking bums who've been in government forever, who are insider trading like crazy and lining their pockets during their terms and post career. How's that working out? Yeah. How's that working out for the average Joe middle class? Or you know, lower middle class like I grew up. How's it working out for those people? Not too good. How's it working out? You know, housing prices, cost of food, the right. inflation that's going on. Healthy food. Healthy food. Chronic disease that we have in this country. 
uh, homelessness, unemployment. How's it working out? As we give, you know, billions of dollars to Ukraine to fight a proxy war. You know, we have a southern border that's, you know, being invaded. If you listen to Mr. Weinstein on uh, Rogan, it's pretty scary. Some of the stuff is going on. The different uh, camps that are down there of individuals. Some mm-hmm. people, Chinese nationalists of military age. Um, other, you know, South American, Central American people. Kind of different ways of they're treated in their different camps. And a lot of scary stuff there. But just the countries in 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 a bad place and it's not going to get better with weekend of Bernie's who can barely put a sentence together if that's even him <laughs> yeah. it's not going to get better right. I don't think with Mr. Trump Mr. President Trump who had four years to do it and kept Anthony Fauci in charge after his record on AIDS with AZT with all these other mm. ridiculous uh, you know supposed pandemics that he was uh, in charge of yeah it's crazy and how the chronic disease level since he's been uh, in some some sort of office in the 80s has exponentially gotten worse autism rates have gotten worse childhood diseases uh, comorbidities uh, just the general health and wellness of our society look at old like 1950s and 60s presidential fitness programs where everybody's fit look at pictures of the beach exactly we have like healthy skinny people and now you have you know a high percentage of kids are you know are are obese high percentage of adults are are morbidly obese you had the the majority of people dying from covid had at least three comorbidities that they were dealing with like we're not getting better having these people in charge yeah Mm -hmm. so why not make a change and i'm going to support bobby and uh, keep spreading his message. Um, but the two-party system that we got in place doesn't work. hasn't hasn't been working. hasn't been working really since JFK was in office. And we need somebody who's willing to lay it on the line. That's what I love about Bobby. Think about it. He killed his uncle. Killed his dad. We know CIA was involved, right? I mean, they they can't declassify it because it's so damning. Mm-hmm. We know the FBI was involved. Hoover hated the Kennedys. Yeah. hated him Alan Dulles was fired as the director of the CIA after he botched the Bay of Pigs and tried to get Operation Northwoods to happen to literally start World War III and invade Cuba mm-hmm. he was fired he was on the fucking Warren Commission Alan Dulles was as was Gerald Ford who was the right hand man of J. Edgar Hoover who hated the Kennedys like we know they're involved um, but so Bobby loses his uncle JFK his father RFK his cousin dies in a plane crash when he was running against Hillary Clinton like I'm not saying that was a conspiracy but it's kind of a weird coincidence Bobby's in danger you know like he's he's putting himself on the line yeah why because he fucking believes in this country he believes in this country he believes in the good in people and he believes he can make a difference that's somebody I can get behind who's willing to lay it on the line because that is like I said earlier the archetype of everything we love about Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. <laughs> everything we love about Frodo and Sam and Aragon and Gandalf and Merry and Pip. Right? Everything that we love about um, Gamora mm-hmm. and Groot and Rocket <laughs> and really? Drax. Like and and um, Chris Pratt's character. Uh-huh. in Guardians yeah. it's these people believe in something sometimes they can't even explain it like in Gladiator when Marcus Aurelius is talking to to um, to Maximus and he's like what is the greatness of Rome you know it's an idea mm-hmm. right? what is the greatness of America it's an idea right that that we can be all the things that were written about in our declarative statements when this country was formed. And I think Bobby's the only way we can get back to on, on, on track to, to be in that America. Yeah. What's something that you're excited about going forward? Could be personal. Like, yeah. Um, I'm excited about playing again. 
You know, I love I love playing, and I fell back in love with the game, and then I had it taken away after four plays. So I miss being out there. I love competing, and even a day like today, I just love you know being able to hit some shots and to make some uh, some good moves on the ball, and yeah. it's fun. But football is my happy place, and that's where I feel most in control of my athletic ability. And I missed that last year. I really, I really missed it. And my heart was broken. And I'm excited about taking the field one more time and going to, uh, not life or death, but going to battle with, uh, with my guys. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the comeback, can you let us in on some of the things that you did for the Achilles recovery? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, um, prayers were really important. So... We, uh, I had some close friends in town the night it happened and we put some prayers into it right away. And then manifestation, because I was really thinking this is it, you know, like this, you don't come back from this injury. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though, you know, I was on my phone researching Kobe Bryant and Mm -hmm. found out that my dear friend, Neil Alatrash had done his surgery. And so texting with Neil and and the doomsday of like my career is over kind of started to go away. But mm-hmm. the next day before we left, cause I flew back to California on the 12th to get surgery on the 13th. I had my sweet friends were still in town and I just said, I said, I need help. I said, I need help. This is going to be really tough. And I just need you all to be there for me on the tough days when I when I stop believing Mm. it's possible Mm. and it's hard to ask for help Mm. it's hard it's hard to receive when you love giving when you love taking care of people Mm -hmm. and and being generous and and that was some tough days some really tough days but I learned to receive a little bit better I had some incredible angels that took care of me mm-hmm. and drove me to rehab sessions and helped me with my food and I got an amazing chef and so we really focused on diet right away and and he was making a bunch of bone broth I was eating I was drinking every single day and awesome um what kind uh mostly beef mm-hmm. yeah um but yeah he was amazing uh with my diet it still is he's he's incredible um I had an amazing uh body work guy who was with me when I was home and we did a bunch of crazy machines, frequency machines, uh, cold lasers. Like the scar looks amazing because we cold laser that thing from the beginning. Mm. Did red light therapy. Um, We did uh, so many different modalities that he was researching. So he's researching all this crazy stuff. My chef is researching all this stuff to like feed me. (laughs) And then I'm getting the absolute best PT from my dear sweet friend Heather at Elite who I did PT with when I broke my collarbone. Uh, um, uh, so that all really helped. And I basically had a conversation with Neil and I said, Neil, let's do something crazy. Let's try and come back as quick as possible. What do you think, how much can we push this and, and still be safe? And so we put a game plan together with Neil, myself and Heather, and we just pushed it. So I believe in moving things as quickly as possible to create blood flow and new Mm. blood flow and healing. So I was in a shoe in 13 days and we pushed it. You know, we just pushed it from the start and got in the Ultra G quickly, got walking, got in a shoe. um, And then just constantly was, you know, talking to my body and putting prayers into into my healing and had some amazing people around me. So all those things. And uh, it's just the mind though. You know, our own self-limiting beliefs yeah. stop us from being the butterfly when, mm-hmm. when we're the caterpillar of just living out our wildest dreams and my wildest dream was coming back and playing yeah. so that was my focus from September 13th when I got surgery and came out of the surgery room until I got back on the practice field after 11 weeks was coming back so you would say the, the strongest modality that you utilize was your mind yeah, yeah. for sure I would agree. And love. Love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just like 
receiving love mm. just Community. from really special people who showed up for me and just loved on me when it was rough when i couldn't move when i was moved to tears on a day because rehab didn't go well just these people that constantly showed up hmm. and and that's why i said what i said earlier you know as shitty as it was and it was the most heartbreaking thing that's happened to me um all the miracles that happened along the way never would have happened yeah. i never would have connected with these people in this way had i not gone through this and obviously i would never want to go through this i wanted to play mm -hmm. and play for our organization mm -hmm. and my teammates and the fans and do something special mm -hmm. but perspective is my reality and when i choose to focus on what happened mm. beautifully during those months fuck, i got a great life and i'm really really fortunate yeah i, I was so interested to, to have this conversation with each of you guys because you know, obviously your recovery time, I think when news started to first come out that you were on a practice field, it was mind blowing for anyone that was a football fan or uh, considering what an Achilles injury has meant historically. Mm. And, you know, I listened to you on, on Rogan talk about, you know, the journey of coming back and you went into some good detail there. But the thing I was curious to hear you touch on was exactly what you guys just said, because to me, each of you have a very similar journey in this case you know you have an incredible amount of belief in yourself to go through the healing journey that you've had and i didn't really know anything about this stuff i, I grew up in pretty much just a western understanding of what was either curable or not and if i could define what i've learned from you it's that there is really an ability to have belief in yourself that you can cure yourself and i'm i was interested to hear you answer that question because it sounds like a lot of what you would describe your healing process to and the speed of it and the recovery mm. is the belief that you were going to heal yourself like that and the love you received from others. And there's an amazing parallel there between the two of you, I think. And it's pretty cool to sit here and see it. Well, thanks to Aaron. You, I mean, we wouldn't be here if you didn't reach out to me. Yeah. Right? After that. Well, And that's, you know... That's the beauty in life is I read that story and was so inspired. Mm -hmm. I was like, because I'm a golf nut, like I, you know, I'm constantly checking, you know, how my starred players are playing and, and who I enjoy watching and watching interviews and, you know, on senior tour and corn Ferry and LPGA and obviously the PGA. Like I just love watching golf. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a, I'm a fan. And so I knew about your story and then you're kind of gone for a couple of years and then you come back out with this, you know, deep dive and you're so open yeah. in a way that's not really accepted. <laughs> you know, it's starting, you know, we're seeing more people like, Oh, it's, it's kind of cool to, you know, talk about medicine, but you know, you're kind of a wacko. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. God, finally somebody says it. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I'm cool with it now. Like, but like, that's the best part. It's but, the yeah. best part. But you never know what it's going to be. Who's going to read that and go and just their whole life changed. Right. So yep. I'm like, this is a homie. We need to connect the people working for the light. Um, because the other side's connected pretty well. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Pretty well coordinated. Yeah, that's true. In their attacks. And we need to make sure that we're supporting each other and loving each other and building each other up. And your story was so inspiring to me because it's everything I believe in that, you know, we've been lied to in some respect about the capacity of our bodies, our minds to heal. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. It's, uh, yeah, it was an honor to hear you reach out to me. And, um, obviously I've, I'm an athlete myself, but the respect I have for, for you and what you've done and, and the things you've gone through has been, um, inspirational, not uh, like I'm very empathetic. I can feel it like with, with others, you know, like it's mm -hmm. the, the reception of what you've done in the last few years of, and your, and your whole career, but mainly the last few years of like doing exactly what we just talked about of, of being the epitome of yourself like mm. just being not not giving a fuck about what others think and and being your truth and it's it's um unfortunately hard to do it these days because of the the weight that other people's judgments have on you and instagram and how 
perfect lives are shown and and not really um shed light on the vulnerability of of everyone's going through shit everyone and to just be able to share it uh on a platform is is cool and i've always said some similar to what you've said it's like if we can just affect one person to to be curious to question to um to open their minds and see what else is out there like break mm-hmm. those walls because what's beyond it is beautiful and more powerful than we could have ever imagined and it's freaking special especially when we get people together and, and groups together that that can talk on um these types of subjects and understand that like the more that we learn the less we know <laughs> Because there's so much yeah. that out there yeah. that is is still yet to be harnessed and and grown. Um, yeah. So thank you, thank you for for initiating um, this, and it's uh, it's been cool that we can we're just growing. I think there's special things to come. Yeah, it's just time for us to be that caterpillar <laughs> living out his wildest dreams mm-hmm. never thought possible why not why mm-hmm. not yeah, i love that i'm i i'd love to ask you just a few what kind of ins- inspiring questions around you know all the kids in this world that watch you on tv and uh want to be like you on the football field have that dream they're aspiring to um you know what what's your message to someone that has a dream and uh, is growing up maybe being told they can or whatever it may be but what what's your message to really kids who want to be like Aaron Rodgers one day mm, it's not easy <laughs> <laughs> um be gentle with yourself be gentle with the journey it's going to be mistakes there's going to be ups and downs the the measure is not how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get back up. Mm. But there's been a great quote. Um, you know, a lot of stuff I say, like, I'm a deep thinker and I love to journal and read. But, like, I love, you know, repurposing things I've heard. You know, they're just the wisdom is in the simplicity and and we all have it within us at mm. some level. Um, and so I try and hold on to my own truths and, and wisdom as gently as possible. Um, also believing in a, a greater sense of the field of value that we're living in. But I do believe that you shouldn't worry about criticism from someone that you would never ask advice from. Mm-hmm. That quote, and it hit me when I was like 38 years old. It was only a couple of years ago. wish I'd heard that when I was 15. Good. Because we care so much about what people think of us and what they say about us most of the time it's people that we would never ask for advice from. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to wrap your mind around that because we, at our core, we want to be seen and understood. We also want to be liked. Yep. You know, we want to be like, (laughs) we want to be liked. We don't want to be like a polarizing, you know, figure who is labeled all these crazy things, (laughs) you know, like me. Like, no, it's kind of my lot and I, you know, I'm not a victim here. I've said things that put me in position and I stand by what I say, but, why we we can't care about criticism from people that we would never ask their opinion to speak in our lives about Mm -hmm. like if i learned that as a younger person Mm -hmm. life would have been a little bit easier same time i'm thankful for the journey and thankful for how i was raised i'm thankful for my high school experience every rough experience led me to figuring things out the way i did Mm -hmm. what i was trying to try and pass on to my younger guys is Let's see if we can do it a little quicker. You know, let's see if we can get all these some of these lessons mm-hmm. before you're thirty, not before you're forty. Um, but self-limiting beliefs and listening to people who, whose opinions actually don't matter are the biggest hindrances to reaching your full potential and dreams. Because uh, a confident person can be unstoppable. Um, a supremely confident, realistic aware person is dangerous mm. and 
like Jordan Peterson says, we need more men to be dangerous mm -hmm. in this world, to step up and, and uh, live their truth. And it's not that you're putting people in danger, mm -hmm. but it's just you living to your full power potential, I believe. Yeah. I think he's what he's saying. I'm speaking for him here, but um, I think that's really, really important. So, um, yeah, it takes a community of people believing in you. Sometimes only one person could be a teacher, could be a coach, could be a parent, mm -hmm. um, could just be a friend, you know. But, you know, trying to bring people along with you, um, but not people who drag you down. You know, be smart about who's in your circle. Mm -hmm. as you get older the circle gets smaller yeah. and it's beautiful mm -hmm. uh, and difficult sometimes but the mm -hmm. circle gets smaller does. and that's part of life it's part of growing up but you know the self-belief the manifestation the confidence the self-love the gentleness the just perspective that this is a journey not a sprint you know it's 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 a long, beautiful ceremony or journey that you're going to go through. Um, and just give yourself as many options as possible. You make a bad decision, that limits your options. You, you're around the wrong person, it limits your options. You listen to people that opinion shouldn't matter, you limit your options. You create more self-limiting options and beliefs. So I wish I'd known a lot of that, but I'm thankful <laughs> for the journey I was on because it still got me to here. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I'm reminded of a, a quote from Rob Lowe that I heard once, which was, uh, never compare your insides to someone else's outsides. Mm. Damn, like that's that. good, too. I like that. Yeah. Kudos, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, what are some of your close timeline goals and life goals? Uh, close timeline goals, uh, just to get a hundred percent healthy. Mm. Uh, that's the biggest one. Um, I have goals for the season. Staying healthy is like we're at the top. Some of that's in my control. Some of it's not. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to cultivate some really good habits right now. So that's kind of my, mm -hmm. my goals are to, excuse me, to keep uh, progressing with my habits and doing things that are life giving and, good for my health because you know getting getting older there's a four in front of that number now it's like <laughs> you know you've lived some life now and, and i want to be healthy and active and flexible and um you know on into my 60s and 70s and, and 80s hopefully um so just making good decisions today that's going to pay off uh tomorrow um i have a lot of uh, medicine goals um, I still feel like medicine is going to be a part of my journey, mm. plant medicine. Mm -hmm. I recently did Combo, which we talked about, which was incredible. Uh, the uh, people I've talked to about Combo, yourself included, talk about a seven-year cycle of Combo. Um, so I'm, yeah, I've done it once, so I'm in my first year of, of those seven. That'll be important. My ultimate goal is to be able to access the realms that I access in medicine without medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that's coming at some point. Mm -hmm. um, some people do it through breath work, which I've done some nice breath work. I enjoy that. But um, not necessarily talking about that. I, I just believe my path at some point will be away from uh, you know, medicine, but not right now. Mm -hmm. And I feel really confident that right now um, when I'm called that there's more medicines to do. There's more journeys to be had. There's more ceremonies. There's more growth um, and, and more beauty to be explored. I look forward to that. Whenever those come up, I don't necessarily like plan them out a year in advance. It's kind of like when it comes up, when I feel it, put it together. So that's a long-term goal as well. There's also personal goals of, you know, I want to be a father at some point. Uh, that's important to me. I got three incredible uh, godsons um, who uh, I love and important to. They have, uh, you know, three sets of amazing parents um, who are really important people in my life. Um that's but I'd like a couple of my own at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got to <laughs> you know, figure that out. Um, but I want to finish well with my career. And that doesn't mean like I have to win a Super Bowl. Obviously, that'd be great. Um, I would love that. But finish well being being a good teammate. Um, putting everything I have into it. And then just letting the chips fall where they may. Which I always optimistically think is going to be in a really good spot. But mm -hmm. you never know. So... 
excited, just really excited about life and, and the, this perspective that you get being in ceremony space, being around incredible like-minded people during those times, sharing deep emotions, you know, everything from the incredible bliss of laughing for nine hours straight in the ceremony to literally <laughs> the two, two nights before being in the fetal position, mm-hmm. sobbing in just like, but still feeling held like in the womb of, of the grandmother and her incredible wisdom and medicine. Um, those are the experiences that I just still live for and love. And I just think there's more of that to happen. Um, and I'm open to it and excited about, uh, about whatever comes next. Incredible. Excited about life is a statement that if someone can utter those words, you're in a good place and it's probably not going to happen without taking a lot of work to get there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Matt, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) See what the universe has planned for me next. Yeah. I'm excited to see it. That will be something good. (laughs) (laughs) Having faith too. Yeah. Faith yep. in the greater good and faith in something above. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. Is that it? We yep. come to our final question here. Bring it on. Oh, man. The uh, the way this podcast was formed was through a long conversation between Jag and I at a, at a dinner table at a bar, actually. And um, the name came to me, I Can Fly because the statement just means so much to me and it's so powerful. Um, and I think in everyone we've talked to, it's been powerful in a certain way um, and different, different ways. Is there a way that you feel the statement um, connects with your life? And is there a time in your life where you felt like you could fly? Yeah, I mean, it connects. I, I... If you would ever ask me what superpower you would want, if you could have one, it would be to fly. <laughs> um, without a doubt, that would be the first thing I would say. Uh, I think maybe a lot of people would. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the art and act of flying involves wind, right? Wind beneath the wings. And wind is the caused by differences in air pressure, right? Mm -hmm. High and low centers moving, constant movement and flow of the universe. Um, And I think that's what flying is all about, is being in tune to the subtleties around us that allow us to soar higher or, you know, coast maybe for a little bit, reevaluate, watching the ground below us. the art of flying is being the observer, right? So many predators in the sky are mm-hmm. observing. I watch every single, when I'm home, I watch the pelicans. Mm-hmm. We're like dinosaurs flying. They look crazy, you know? <laughs> but what are they doing? They're watching the ground the entire time. They're so present what's going on. And they nosedive and try and, you know, get some get some of those little feeder fish down there. But, but the idea of flying to me is a presence, a total presence. Mixed, it's, it's a beautiful... Um, uh, a dichotomy almost where incredible focus and presence in the moment and then absolute liberation mm-hmm. isn't that where we want to be just absolute unadulterated freedom mm-hmm. but also the presence to be in that moment yeah. right of where I'm at what I'm doing not every bird in the sky is always in predator mode but um, just the freedom to soar as high as we want Robert Sala our head coach had a pretty cool bird analogy that I'd actually never heard that he used in training camp. He was talking about the eagle and the crow right. and the fact that the crow is the only bird that's going to fuck with the eagle, right? Just constantly kind of nagging at him, nagging at him. And how does the eagle get rid of the crow? He flies to a, a height the crow can't match mm. and the crow loses the ability to breathe at the highest of levels. So all the haters, all the things trying to bring, you know, bring you down personified by the crow in this analogy you know, the goal is to, to, to maybe not out, you know, outpace them, out distance them. It's to just rise above them, mm-hmm. to rise above all the things that are trying to hold you down in this life. Mm-hmm. Um, unlocks the presence to be present in the moment, and the unabashed, unadulterated liberation. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks for your time and your openness and sharing, you know, the, this hard times and and the beautiful times and, um, yeah, this is this is special. It means a lot that, that you can join us and take time out of your life for this. And um, I look forward to the next couple of days as our teammates going in the Pura Vida Classic here at Ohupi. Time to get our name on a little trophy. I think. <laughs> Yeah. JB and I are going to have something to say about oh, that. Oh, yeah, let's but, go. Man. You know, we'll see. All we'll right. see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's really thanks, special. Guys. And wishing you the best of luck. Keep though. up the good work. These yep. conversations, you know, inspire a lot of people. So keep it up. Appreciate it, fellow. Yeah. Thank you.